open Monday, December 19th, a meeting of the select board to order at 7.02 p.m., just a couple minutes behind schedule. All thank you very much. Um, and as you see, Mike is joining us virtually, so I'll be um, sharing in his semi absence or virtual presence, if you will. Um, so, our first item of the is to approve the agenda. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with a couple of minor modifications. I would add the minutes of the December 9th special meeting to the consent agenda. Um, which is all that was do. I just learned that on December 5th, the date for the pick practice will be corrected in those <laughs> minutes on consent. Um, and then um, when Steve comes to the planning department budget under manager items, we also offer to give a brief update on the parks planning study at that time. I'll second that with the uh, amendments. Moved and seconded for the discussion. All those in favor? Uh, aye. 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 So, thank you. Um, consent agenda items. We need to have a couple of amendments. I'll take a motion to approve. Move. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Hi. Uh, now is the time for the public to speak, whether in person or via Zoom, um, on something that's not on the agenda, and would ask you to come up um, and state your name and then um, speak if you would like. Or if you're on Zoom, you can do a hand raise. Is there anybody who would like to speak? All right. Seeing none. We will move right on. Uh, select for, oh, actually, I would love to speak as a member of the public, and if I didn't write down here for time. Um, but we noted, uh, technically, Bill, this is your last meeting with us before you're officially uh, retired. So we just want to give a big thanks and glad yes. you're here. And it feels like a momentous occasion, so it's worth marking. Thank you very much. Yeah. I will not be able to find something Probably didn't have. <laughs> and since we totally forgot all our company, I also want to give a shout out to Skip Flanders and the other folks who helped to organize the pancake breakfast for staff and volunteers and Tom in particular for being there at 6 a.m. to make pancakes. Um, <laughs> but I'm not as organized as Skip. I don't have a card, but do you want to make <laughs> the work button for work by Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hopefully we can move that another day next year. Um, and uh, Alyssa and Dan did not get adequate recognition. Oh, no, uh, sorry, we're there. So. It was great. Um, fantastic. We will move along to our select board item. And first is Lieutenant White. Vermont State Police. George. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I will first apologize for my attire. Normally, I don't uh, show up in the uniform. It's been a rather busy day for my other full time job. So, um, and it will continue right now tomorrow morning. So, uh, yeah, busy. The uh, end of 2022 is starting out to be um, an active one for. Uh, the tactical thing, at least. Um, so, as long as we're uh, echoing our appreciation for Bill, I'd like to thank you for the last four and a half years of us uh, working together to make this um, semi pilot. I would say it was moved beyond just the pilot project, but from its uh, beginning in 2018 to where we are now, I think we've, uh, we've done a lot for, hopefully, we've done a lot for the uh, for the entire town of Waterbury, not just the uh, the village. Um, certainly, it's always a uh, a work in progress. Just to make sure that we're tending to the needs of uh, the individual municipality, and especially for for you guys, this one, since um, obviously we have a lot of stake in uh, in this town and what we're what we have and what we continue to build on. Um, just in terms of uh, the last year, kind of broadly speaking. State Police, Middlesex, now Berlin. Um, 
In uh, June, we moved into our, our new office in uh, Berlin. The definitely a, a much nicer space, more up to date than uh, Middlesex, which is is a um, a good thing to have a nice place for all the troopers, including the library troopers, to uh, to call home when they need to be there. Um, certainly, it does uh, when they have to come to Berlin. It definitely takes them a little bit further away from the town of Waterbury, but uh, we do what we can to limit the amount of time that they that they are in the town. Uh, certainly, speaking with uh, Bill over the over the year, um, speeding is still a uh, a concern for the town, and it's it's been a delicate balance for us coming out of COVID trying to get back into the, uh, the the traffic side of things simply because we were restricted on what we were allowing the troopers to do to, to limit their contact with individuals and certainly uh, as, as old habits once you get out of the habit it's, it's a little bit more difficult to get back in I think in the last at least several uh, several months um, we've gotten back into that uh, a little bit better. I can think to, to push those guys to, to do more. Um, because like I said, just speaking with Bill on a regular basis, that seems to be one of the chief concerns uh, for the town is um, just speedy complaints. Uh, in terms of criminal stuff, um, outside of the uh, some of the drug stuff that we dealt with earlier on in the year, there's no real trends or over overarching problems um where we deal with uh we deal with the things as they come kind of one day two days here and there there's no um things like thefts or larcenies or or stuff like that going on um we had quite an issue with uh juveniles at the at the park and ride for quite a while uh that seemed to calm down um in the, in the last several months so uh we we do our best to address the needs when when they get brought to our attention um and uh and we can help to continue to foster this relationship with the town um, speaking of the park and land, um i believe there was a situation and i maybe i don't know if you can talk about it but could you make an arrest with regard to family and voting stuff uh we had um and i'm not sure exactly how much uh water bearing was involved but there was a, a much larger um scale investigation that went into that kind of an overarching uh, central Vermont problem that uh, we were able to kind of one one of the arrests was by just by sheer luck um, one of the troopers doing doing good work seeing something suspicious pulling in checking it out and as, as it would be there were people under car actually uh, taking cattle converters off so um, you know, sometimes, that was that was the yeah, issue we had with the yeah, yeah. Sometimes we just get uh, we just get that lucky um, to to just happen along and, and see something that, that looks out of place. Yeah. And I forgot what we started. Uh, since you've been here last, you kind of um, Alyssa Johnson and Roger Bob have been elected to the board, and they are here. Um, and we're working with yeah, thank one of your officers for uh, catching my son speeding and stoning. <laughs> and, 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 uh, we taught him a good lesson at, at an impressionable age, and uh, you know, I really do think it's, it's a good thing for him. It wasn't a good thing for us uh, internally, but uh, we're yeah. making the best of it, and uh, you know, I'm glad to get it. Other questions? Yeah, hold on. Okay. So before you start, I quickly went back and I don't have every uh, monthly report uh, that Lieutenant Point has sent this year. I was missing April, and the last one I have is October. You probably haven't finished the November yet. But uh, for um, for nine months, uh, all I checked was the number of calls in the town. About 559 calls is what I told up that for April is about 34 in December. So, um, by that, by it's over 60 a month, and of late it's been picking up. As Lieutenant White did indicate, um, in, in October there were 
by some 18 traffic stops, and that's significant in time when it was at the beginning of the year when it was almost done. Uh, and almost nine million was from April of 2020 right through uh, the beginning of this year. So it's a big time Clearly, there were things that they made stops for if there was somebody with an egregious violation, but they probably won't stop people that were going so well. And also, I'm sure as we've noticed in the last the last few recaps, um, due to uh, due to some very rough uh, snapping conditions in uh, in Berlin, we've had to uh, pull the water very super um, for for this and that a little bit more than we actually more than we ever have uh, in the uh, you know, four and a half years at this point. Um, and that just that continues to be um, a struggle that we face. We have uh, the 14 shippers that we're supposed to have working at the barracks. We have currently six vacancies, uh, which means that um, just about every single shift we are at our bare minimum staffing. Um, and certainly, it's it's not unique to just Berlin. The entire state is is facing. Um, <laughs> Un unprecedented vacancies. Uh, I think we're at between um, our actual vacancies, long term um, illness, sickness, um, injuries, uh, suspension, uh, things like that. We're, we're at somewhere around 60 vacancies for the, for the entire department. Um, you figure if, if, uh, if one merits is, is hurting that much, the entire state is. We actually have a system of mandatory overtime for everyone um, from sergeant and below every two months um, every sergeant and below and all of the ranks is required to work at least one shift coverage overtime somewhere in the state um, and if you do not fulfill that then when the vacancy shifts come open then you will be actually ordered to work uh, shift could be anywhere in the state depending on where the needs are so um, I've been doing this for just shy of uh, 20 years now. Never have we ever thought we would have to be in a situation where we would have to order people to come um, to work shifts. So it's um, it's a pretty bad state of affairs right now. And again, it's we're not you know certainly Vermont, um, Berlin isn't unique. The uh, the state isn't very unique, and the entire profession is unique. It's, it's uh, issues that increase. Interesting issues that municipal departments. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yes. We had the same uh, two officers uh, since the beginning. Of the no, no. Um, I think we've had two in each. No, three, 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 three nations. Three, three nations and two nights. Yes. Yeah. Danny. Mike has his hand. Oh, Mike. Thank you. I assume I'm unmuted. Un un uh, Lieutenant White, sorry I can't be there. I kind of have a family kind of issue that I'm <clears throat> tending to. But I want to thank you and all the troopers for everything that you do for both Waterbury and the state of Vermont as a whole. Uh, I just want to ask you more something in, in regards to trends in, in, in policing. I know with all everything, the state police, you hear about Burlington, they're all down in staff numbers compared to where they probably should be. Uh, do you see, I know we can't expect the state police to do a lot of the quality of life, the you know traffic stops and that type of stuff with probably what are more urgent type matters in the state. Do you see that letting up and or or it's going to just get worse with the uh, staffing levels? And just as a note, I don't know if other people, the, the audio is not very good out here in Zoom land. Thanks. Uh, yes, in terms of, uh, you know, law enforcement in general, especially for the, the state police. Um, yeah, that's certainly not anything that's going to change uh, for us. Anything? 
Okay. Yeah, that's that's certainly not nothing that um, I see changing uh, in the foreseeable future with our with our staff and all the way they are. Okay. Mike, is the audio just quiet or is it breaking up? No, it's just a little um, more muffled than anything else. Okay. And I have my uh, speaker up to maximum, and it's just. Right. Oh, All right, we'll try to speak up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's an owl problem or what. It's an owl. It's definitely the owl. <laughs> <laughs> Not owl. Yep. Chris, you have a question as well? No, it sounds better now. I, I, I... I feel like I got a loud voice. Mm -hmm. So uh, I asked. Uh, have you here? I think maybe that's why you're here. Um, because I've got some huge concerns um, for our community as well, along with many others in the state, the state as a whole. Uh, I just had a um, cousin of mine, very close cousin like that, um, die from cocaine fentanyl overdose in May. Uh, I am now. Uh, Feeling the impact, financial impacts of his death because I stepped in and helped him out with something, uh, some financial issues that I thought were caused from something other than a drug problem. Um, so I'm feeling the impacts, small portion of the impacts, along with his death. Uh, of, of what some people are going through as a result of the drug problem. Um, so one of the questions, you know, I have some bigger concerns because of my fear of what's happening at the southern border. Uh, the fentanyl infusion and along with other drugs uh, and criminals coming into the, into the country, um, the godaways and, um, you know, we just the, and don't I know we get into this. I'm not fifty. It's not bragging at all. Okay, I'm just. But uh, yes. Yeah. So anyway, um, my concern is for the future of our communities uh, and the impact on the potential of what's coming. Um, I'm I'm curious to know why we're losing. If, well, I, I'm not really curious, but I think I know some of the reasons why we're losing police officers. Uh, not only here, but across the country. Uh, Los Angeles is about to lose 300 more for a total of 800 this year. Um, policies that are being, being put in place are making it uh, frustrating for police officers to do their jobs. Um, you know, under the public safety uh, department, is there other divisions in there other than uh, state police officers that are in that public safety umbrella, or is it basically officers and uh, I don't know if there's detectives included in that department. Um, I guess my question is, I've heard some things about state's attorneys uh, and the fact that we're losing them in Washington County. I'm understanding that we are gonna be down to one here shortly. Uh, I don't know if you can verify that or not. Um, and my concern is that if police officers are having a hard enough time arresting criminals, it seems like the next step is prosecuting them. And if that's if that was tough before because of maybe changes in policy uh, or you know judges. Uh, you know what the, the the sentences they're handing down. I don't know where the link, the broken link in the chain is. I don't know if you can shed light on that at all. Uh, and I'm just wondering. So my biggest concern was as a board member to continue to <clears throat> let this go on and not speak up about it. I just I'm too compelled to be too concerned mm -hmm. for the people in my communities. Uh, it just stay, stay silent, right? So if you can shed any light on that, it certainly helps. Okay, well, first of all, sorry for your time. Um, 
in terms of uh, the public safety umbrella, the, the Department of Public Safety, it actually includes uh, the fire service, it includes uh, emergency management, and then Vermont State Police covers all of the detectives, all the specialized units. Um, so they, the, all of that falls under the actual Vermont State Police, which is under the Department of Public Safety umbrella. So it's Department of Public Safety is, is a, a very large, um entity and in and of itself vsb is only one portion of that we are, we are the largest of that but we are just one portion of, of public safety um in terms of are there other people losing or, or other departments losing people yeah it's it's across the board um and the reasonings uh anywhere from just natural attrition for for um retirements to um, things like you said, the, the legislation um, that that we're plagued by, uh, a lot of um, younger people that have gotten into it, um, perhaps they're, they're leaving because they don't agree with some of this legislation. Uh, they're going. A lot of our people that we lose go to the go to federal agencies. Um, what I can say is, many of the people who have left Vermont State Police for other law enforcement uh, agencies, whether they be Mass State Police, uh, New York State Police. Um, we had some folks leave for like the air marshals. They're all coming back. So they actually see the value in what we have in Vermont. Um, and they're coming back from state police. Uh, and a lot of that is goes to say that, you know, the the way overall the way Vermont State Police treats their people. This is what I'm hearing from the people that have left. They get treated like it's not just a number. Like in New York State Police, it's, it's just a number. Whereas, I mean, we we know all of our people. We have we only have we're only 320 stops for the entire state police department itself. So, um, so that's that's one credit to to us um, for Vermont State Police. Uh, like I said, most people that are leaving state police and not coming back, they're going to some federal department uh, or some federal agency, um, whether the, the grass is greener or they like the retirement and the benefits, stuff like that. But that's that's where a lot of our people are going that are not returning. Um, in terms of just the overall drug issue, uh, we have probably Four, I think we have four uh, drug detectives in the northern half of the state, um, and the biggest majority of their time has been spent, um, they've been detailed to deal with Burlington. Um, issues going on in Burlington, which like, naturally, um, everything else is, is growing, which is why I'm just like this and been busy for all day today, probably all day tomorrow, probably the better part of this week. Um, because we've recognized that we state police have recognized that, and they've decided, okay, there's only so much we can do for Burlington until Burlington starts doing something for themselves, and we are reallocating those assets back into the state police areas where where they should be. Um, so there there is a bit of a turn, and like I said, I we are. I mean, this, this could be the, the the busiest week I've had in 12 years of the, of the state was task. Um, having multiple missions, um, dealing with everything from drugs to the pick of homicide. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, we're playing catch up, um, without a doubt. We're playing catch up now because, again, we, we decided, we, Decided that that we were going to try and help Burlington as much as we could, and it got to to a fault of, of our own and of our own communities that that we should be spending more of our assets time. Unfortunately, I would have said to Burlington, "You make your bed, but you lay in." They're getting exactly what they asked for, uh, and now they wish they had asked for. Uh, so, my concern is for the future impacts of what, and I don't know if this has been talked about in, in public safety about possible floods of you know, yet additional drugs uh, into our communities, along with many others in the country. Um, 
Is there any proactive, even as is, is low staff as you are, is there any preparation or consideration for trying to deal with that, being proactive before they are solving? And I think that's that's what we're doing by by picking off some of these um, some of these networks that that we're dealing with currently. Um, we're I don't have direct access to that information, but it's my understanding that there are, are some ties into those those bigger things. You know, everything that we get up here from from the drugs comes out of Springfield, the Holyoke, or Hartford, Connecticut. You know, so everyone's tripping up here because they can they can sell their product or so much more, um, which has always been the case uh, for Vermont. That's why Vermont has has had the issues that it's had right now. Any efforts in the school system to try to convince adults of the impact of, of what this could mean for their life? Deadly impact. Just ruining, complete ruining of their lives. Um, you know, sometimes probably more than you know, I barely graduated from school. If you need to hit me over the head. Making me understand that getting involved in any of that crap is a dead end road. I got four grandchildren, and I'm deeply concerned about them and the other children of their age. You know, we're dealing with what we imagine 15 years from now if something isn't done. So, what, as a community member on the board. What can we do as community members, whether it be putting pressure on the legislative representatives that we have to start paying attention, more attention for this problem, growing problem, and start to try to convince them to put the policies in place? Never had before that give them teeth to, to your effort. Uh, I think that's that's certainly a, a the, that's the best possible starting point because uh as a whole certainly state government state entity we are driven by the, the legislatures and and what they're what they're pushing down so our hands are are tied at times with, with what we can cannot do um, and what gets what gets passed and in these sessions is, is what we have to live with um and you know to, to speak to your other point about like the state's attorneys and the judges um you know again we can go out and and arrest everyone but we can't arrest our way out of this problem it's it is far above just putting people giving people a, a piece of paper and putting them in front of a judge um this there's no possible way to arrest our way out of this problem we we can we can only do so much from this side it's it's the bigger picture that that you've spoken of that that is, is the issue as a whole. I mean, I, I, this is my speculation that the drug cartels have become so strong uh, along the southern border that the only the only way to curtail it will be military action because uh, they're getting so powerful. Uh, it's three to ten thousand dollars per person to come across the border. And yes. But anyway, um, I appreciate your time tonight. Uh, we could talk for hours. Um, and, uh, you know, if I were in your shoes, I, I'm so passionate and so upset about this that uh, if I were you, I would <coughs> say to the rest of all the troopers in the state, if we're not getting any change made, maybe it's time to lay our badge down and say to you guys, turn things around, start to help us out, and I'll help you. Well. That's just the type of person I am. I don't I don't deal with these types of things very good. Uh, how are you? Um, thank you very much for your time, especially on a busy night. Um, two just points as it relates to Chris said. One, our next visitors, I'm sure, can speak to education and what may or may not be happening. So glad they're also on the agenda tonight. Um, Two, by virtue of us being in the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns has a legislative platform informed by communities across the state. Bill was our proxy and voted on it, but I just want to state that 
the lead has it, and they have two full time advocates for municipalities. So, if there was something a municipality wanted to do, I'm just naming that those are platforms. Um, Black question is from a local perspective. I know we have an agreement from a couple of years. Clearly, you're feeling it in staffing. In terms of long term viability for the town, do you have any concerns or things in terms of like proactive down the road thinking about maintaining the contract? You know, you spoke to. It. Yeah, I don't, um, you know, it, it's it's my priority uh, to ensure that we are fulfilling our our folks being in the town. Um, and it is, it is only on an emergent basis that, that we, we pull them out. Um, so I mean, that is that is is my dedication to this. You know, I, I got into this position at the very beginning um of this contract and um again i think that um you know it's it's been good for for the state police uh i know that there's there's people all across there's municipalities all across the state that are dissolving their their police departments and it is uh falling on to the state police just to so those those towns up and i think having having this in place certainly shows um that waterbury is is concerned enough about the the public their community to enter into something like this because the level of service that the berlin barracks could give to the town of waterbury is a lot different than the two waterbury troopers um could could provide um you know we have not including water here we have 18 towns that that we provide full law enforcement coverage for right now this very second three troopers three troopers are covering 18 towns so your staffing issues uh a lot of it yes yeah i mean if just on any given monday if we were at full staff we would have a minimum of four to five uh, if we were fully staffed. Um, so that's just our our bare minimum staffing is is that three three people um, on like on a Monday through Thursday, and then we up it to four uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sundays, just because you know the the population within Central Vermont can double, triple, quadruple um, on any given weekend day or night. I would like to just also point out that while Mike is correct that maybe we don't get the retail type uh, uh, service that people were used to when we had the village of Waterbury Police Department, but I would like to just acknowledge the two troopers that we do have and the fact that they do step up and try to become helpful in this community. Both of them are here for the River of Light Parade uh, just a week or so ago uh, when we have the North Point Independence Day event. They're here for that. Uh, they do try to in interject themselves into the community as best as possible. It's, it's not the same uh, as it was when, when we had uh, a local police force that could get into the businesses every day. But these guys do care about the community and they try to interact with people here. Um, whenever I've had occasion to call, uh, I'm pretty much a, a chain of command type of person. So if there's a need, I contact the parent white and then he tells the troops that they, they will call me and they'll come and talk with me. But they've been very responsive throughout the whole course of this contract and the two guys that we talk about. Uh, clearly, uh, I think I've committed to them. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Yeah, um, thank you for your service and, and the service that your two troopers provide to us. Uh, in regard to uh, Chris's concerns, uh, is there anything that the select board can do to try to alleviate the, the drug problem as it exists uh, here in Waterbury? Certainly, any any concerns they get get brought to you, just um, make sure they get forwarded to the, either myself or either one of the either one of the troopers. That way, that they can at least know what's going on, spend some extra time, and you know what, whatever area that might be. I know there's 
there's always people talking in town um, and probably some of the, the drug arrests and, and encounters that we dealt with uh, earlier in the year are, are um, proof that just a little bit of word of mouth. You know, unfortunately, so many people say, oh, well, if I know what's going on, you know, the, the state police have to know what's going on. Well, um, we're, we're, we're usually the, the people that no one wants to know what they're doing. Um, so people go to great lengths to, to make sure that we're, we're not in the know. So um, we can we can suspect and surmise that things are, are happening, but uh, just just a little bit of information to kind of point us in the right direction. We might have intel on a, on a certain neighborhood and, and you know, information that people here could, could get us to, to this corner or something like that. So. Yeah. And from my perspective, uh, I think that this arrangement is working well for the town. Uh, uh, I don't believe that we can afford to set up our own private uh, police work at this point. And I don't, even if we could, I don't believe that the uh, personnel are available to hire. So uh, I appreciate what you're doing. And you're not working. Okay. You know, one more. One more question. Oh. And then I'm done. Okay. Huh? Do you have a question also? I do, but Chris can go first. Hold on. Um, so to Roger's point, uh, hmm. yeah, if there's anything that we can assist you guys uh, so that you don't get pressured to have a full time police support, of course, but you're right, we could do it in a way, shape, or form, not only from a cost perspective, but also from a faculty perspective. So, um, I was a big proponent of hiring just the city police officers and not create our own town and see how that went. Mm -hmm. uh, been successful in my eyes and others. And I was wondering if this rubbed off, I mean, how come it hasn't rubbed off this model? Has it rubbed off? I think when it first kicked off, a lot of towns were, were very interested in it. And for, for one reason or the other, I think the other being, <laughs> um, I, I'm, a, I'm a blunt person, so I'm just going to say it. Uh, they didn't care about their community enough to to invest in in the in the resource. Because, like I said, if 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 we go to something right now in Moortown, you're not going to get the same response that we would from from the local troopers that are that are here. Um, and it's and in my eyes, that that's all it comes down to: a, a community that had some sort of department that dissolved that police department and doesn't put the effort into to doing something else, whether it be just a a, a long term contract, not a not a eighty hour a week contract, but you know even even a, a local contract for for service, ten twelve hours a week. If they're doing something to to invest in their community to to help get that uh, law and order restored, um, even if it's not to the level of the full time police department, they just don't have enough buying from the community. They don't appreciate the service that law enforcement is. The, the other thing, too, not to you know, bash the municipalities, but I, I also think an issue has to be the, the vacancy level that the city police has right now. I mean, they, they can't commit all of their resources to these types of contracts because there are a lot of things that we can't. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think we got in at the right time. Having Mark here was helpful uh, to, you know, pave the way with his his ties with the state police, and uh, you know, it, it worked. And I know when we entered the agreement, uh, the state kind of made it clear because I know other municipalities that asked that we're going to see how it works in Waterbury before we think about doing this anywhere else. So. Those few years were kind of uh, just not spare money, but uh, so. Um, I have one question. Um, I won't believe the issue. Uh, some of the marriage, but we'll look at it. Some of the larger communities across the state have um, they've either created positions. I think Burlington involves some community health workers, where they've done partnerships with mental health providers to. When you get those calls where it's a mental health issue and not a police issue, that you can hand that off to a professional. Yes. Um, is there a substantial need for that in Waterbury? Is that something we should be thinking about? Well, so um, 
I don't know that the the level of calls um, would necessarily support uh, an independent person just for water there. What I can tell you is we have a position within Berlin. Um, we had it filled for about four months and the person moved on. Um, just last week, uh, we did some interviews for to fill that position again. I feel we have a, um, a very strong candidate. Um, so fingers crossed because this is the, the third round of it. Like, you know, mental health services, uh, the mental health workers that we're trying to put into every barracks, it, it's not unlike any other profession to include law enforcement, getting people to do the work is the, the most difficult thing. Um, so if we fill this position, that would be something where if one of those calls were in Waterbury, uh, you would come out uh, with the troopers and respond to those scenes, um, and you would have that that person right there. Okay. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's, it's helpful and enlightening, I think, for everybody to hear both the board and the public. So we really appreciate it. Hope we get some rest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if there's any further that we have any more, we can reach out to us. We have another guest. And thank you. Um, our superintendent. Oh, you're switching? No, no. Oh. no. Come on up. <laughs> Just Hello, thank you for having me. Mike Licklider, I'm the new superintendent. I'm uh, coming up on my six month anniversary in the district. So uh, one of the things I wanted to do as part of our entry plan, the board has uh, done a number of activities since July, uh, introduced me to the community to reach out to each of the select boards and have an opportunity to sit down and, and share what's going on in our schools and, and see if there's anything that uh, you have questions with and just open the door that if there's an, ever any time if you'd like to hear something i'm always welcome to attend a meeting and i'm always happy to do that and uh, reach out and have conversations so since i've been here now i'll give you a little bit of an update on the entry plan uh, it started with some uh, opportunities to meet uh, various communities. I'm not going to go through this whole piece. You can take a look at it on your own. But as part of my entry, uh, I did a, a survey, a community survey that went to students, faculty, parents, community members. We had 660 responses, which is an excellent, uh, excellent response. And I categorized, I went through each one individually. I categorized uh, the issues, uh, parents, uh, community members, boys. Anything from positives to negatives. Uh, so I went through, I listed in there the number of responses we received for strikes of the school district as far as and, and needs as well. And then as part of that information, as well as my, my, my observations in the schools, I try to be in a school every day. Uh, I'm generally in our high school at least three times a week and uh, proposed four goals to the board, uh, four goals uh, that we start working on. It's a little late. Uh, we we chose in October, it was in November. Uh, the goals around academics, improving academics, uh, budget, taking a bit for your budget plan, improving community relations and information we get to the public, and then also taking a look at uh, the issues with Harwood High School and uh, a proposal for a new bond uh, a process for community engagement before we actually come up with the finalization for that bond. So that's where we are right now. Uh, I'm, we have a board meeting on Wednesday. I'm going to talk to the board about the milestones for the rest of the year with the goals. And I uh, look forward to continuing to meet members of the community. I'm very impressed with the schools and the communities that uh, are that, that serving. Uh, my wife and I live in South Duxbury, right next to Harvard High School. And uh, we've been uh, enjoying getting to know and uh, very happy for, uh, for snow this weekend <laughs> as well. But I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, Bob. Uh, you mentioned school climate. Yes, as a need. Could you explain more about that? Sure. Uh, and, and school climate, uh, the definition of, of climate is how students and faculty feel a part of the community. Uh, I know last year there, was, there were a number of issues that were uh, voiced uh, from students and faculty about climate, particularly at this high school, uh, more than any other place. And I think there were multiple reasons for that. 
Uh, I think there are some some areas of improvement that we can make as a school district uh, that I've talked to the board about. But I also think uh, the last two years in school districts, not just in this district, not just in the state, but around the country, have been incredibly challenging. Uh, I was a superintendent for the last 13 years in another school district in another state. And I can tell you that uh, those two years were the hardest in my 32 years in public education. Uh, we saw issues around school climate. Uh, there were there was a lot of concerns last year with vandalism, with vaping. And again, they were not just hardwood issues. They were issues that I, I experienced 450 miles away that schools experienced around the country. Uh, I think we're making some progress and, and in talking to our students uh, and, and faculty, uh, they're, they're feeling much better about that climate this year. But there are areas that we need to continue to work on uh, in a very focused way. Other questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How about that school calendar to get closed on uh, voting day? Yeah, that, that would be hard. <laughs> so there was there was one parent who voiced concern. What I can share with you is uh, we did have, uh, and I assume it was through Waterbury, a, a Washington County Sheriff yes. at the polling place. <laughs> yes. And uh, the two principals uh, in the school graph just were able to not have any concerns with that. Uh, with, with the public there, they felt that it was well, se well separated. We had a sheriff who was on duty. So from the principals and, and the teachers, we did not hear concerns, although one parent did uh, bring up that, that concern. So I'd be happy to have conversations with the uh, with the select board. Um, having a district-wide day off on a Tuesday, when, when this is about the only polling place we use, would be challenging. Uh, uh, oh, there was a district-wide so uh, it just seems to me that um, that could have been foreseen. I mean, two years ago, they had general election day. Uh, I think last year's calendar, even though it wasn't election day, they had it off. And then this year, when it's election day, that long at the school. And, um, you know, I understand that the other communities. Uh, don't use the schools necessarily for uh, voting. Uh, Lexbury, I guess, I don't know if they're going to stay with drive through voting forever, but when they voted, they used the school. And for a town like Waterbury, there's no other place to, to go. And from the perspective of school safety, I'm, I'm glad that the principals didn't feel that there was an issue. But uh, just in terms of the logistics of Finding places to park, finding ability to get in and out of the building. Um, it seems one day every two years could be accommodated. So. And I'm not sure how that came back into the schedule this year. Uh, I didn't create the calendar for this year. But I'm, I'm not blaming anybody. I, right. I, I just, I'm not trying to come off as, you know, this is the biggest deal right. in, in that there is. But I think that, uh, you know, we did hear from a number of people, and when I say a number, you know, a handful of people, but there were some people that were very upset that their kids had to go to school when there was voting, and I understand all of the issues with regard to school safety, um, but uh, we had a couple of people who suggested that we could use this room. Well, there's not enough space to park here. Uh, this room looks big, but it, it has capacity of about uh, 85, and I think how many voting stations did they come up there? Uh, there are seven voting stations. The, the... I think we could fit three or eight. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. there's just no other place. And I, if you would keep that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm actually surprised, sir, to hear you say that the principals were okay with it because there were there was hostility that day. There was teachers that were very anxious. There were voters that were very anxious. Um, so I'm surprised to hear that that was described to you as like a working situation. It was it was not a great situation. Yeah, I think the Oscars just not supposed to have the conversation yet. Just for right. it was like this. Um, I think yeah, a lot of folks we did hear from a handful of parents as well, and um, both the email and on it. So we have to, I have that conversation to look at it again. What I can share. Uh, I, I, I had experience with closing on that Tuesday, and, and there is a split between parents who will say, I'd rather have the school closed and safety, and other parents who will say, it's 
Yeah, have, having going to school on a Monday, having off on a Tuesday, going back mm -hmm. to school Wednesday, Thursday, Friday mm -hmm. is educationally challenging. And uh, sometimes we hear that from parents as well that the middle of the day, uh, a, a, a day off in the middle, middle of the week, week is not yeah. always yeah. helpful for parents. Either. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd be happy to take the take the blame for that. And you can tell those parents that it's for the safety of their children that the school not open that day. But but yeah, I'd like to continue that conversation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No. Yeah. Other questions on the board? Um, what's your timeline on this uh, developing the three-year budget? Uh, well, we're, right now we're in the middle of our budget for next year. So part of the milestone will be finish that piece up. And then we also have a new director of finance. Our previous director of finance, uh, Michelle Baker, retired after 25 years. Uh, Lisa Essler is, uh, came on board with me. So she's also learning the system as well. Uh, Lisa has uh, uh, been coming to Vermont her whole life. Uh, they, they had a home in, in Warren for, for, for many years, uh, but she was a vice president for finance at Rutgers University. So she, she has the, a, a long experience uh, with a pretty budget. So we'll, we'll be working on that, taking a look at projections and uh, getting the board information to help project out some of our expenses. So, so this three year plan uh, would be coming up for a year from now? Or but we hope to have 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 something in place by the end of the year based on assumptions and the information that, that we had at the time. But it's helpful. It's something that I've always done as a superintendent had my finance director work on a, either a three year or five year uh, budget just to project out and uh, better information for, for initiatives. Right. Danny, Mike's hand is raised. Oh, thanks, Mike. Yep, thanks, Danny. Uh, hi, Mike. Sorry, I couldn't be with you. Mike. Or I couldn't be with you in person. Uh, uh, definitely welcome. This is a long overdue meeting, and I'm glad we could have you at the select board meeting. One comment I just want to make. I know whether you know you've been on a little bit, but Waterbury has had a hard time retaining uh, our representatives to the select board. Is there anything that you the, the retention of you know Waterbury's members. Well, and that was a question when I went through the interview process I had for the board because we do have, uh, in general, a, a pretty sizable turnover not just for Waterbury. Uh, the uh, when I was hired in February, uh, seven of those board members turned over by the time I started in, in July, and uh, from conversations I had with the board uh, and then. Uh, Kelly, who's our vice chair, is here, so she may have some input on that as well. But I do think that uh, we're, we're a small district and we expect a lot from our school board members. Uh, I came from a district that was uh, three times the size and uh, we had nine board members. We had a lot more stability, but I think there have also been a lot of challenges uh, with, with the unification process for the board over the last six years. And that's one of our goals to create a, a environment for one that representatives from each of the town's voices can be heard, but at the same time that board members want to stay and, and want to have some longevity in their seats because turnover is 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 challenging for a school district, it's challenging for a superintendent, and it's something that uh, I want to do everything I can as a superintendent to encourage uh, board members to stay for their at least for their three-year terms. Uh, Kelly, if you have anything you wanted to yeah, I just I wanted to touch base on your meeting last um last week or in no, December. I'm sorry, we were having a problem. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I just so thank you for having us. Um and you know, just to touch base on the the open seats and stuff to start there. I know that the last one for Waterbury was um um was because the person who was on on the board had moved out of the district and it is against the uh state law for someone to be on the board who is not living in the district so there was that and then i think there were a couple other things but as mike said we have appointed a lot of people and it's across the entire board um not just waterbury um we do a lot of work um i think and, and that's the importance, you know, it was frustrating to hear that um, folks wouldn't 
give a recommendation for somebody who was coming forward to volunteer their time on elected board because it's really important to have everybody at the table representing their towns and then to share the, the workload. You know, um, there's a lot of committees and a lot of, um, I had no idea how much work there was <laughs> being vice chair when I took the seat. So, you know, um, there's that, you know, and talking about um, also what are we doing at the board? It, it has been uh, last year was the year that we set the goals. And it was really a transition year, having a, a new CFO and having a new superintendent. It was really important to have a seamless, um, um, smooth entrance for both of those people and to bring them up to speed on where our district is. Um, Mike was from Pennsylvania or and uh, Lisa was working outside of the state. So she was not, current in what was happening in our district. Um, we have also been really working hard to change the policy on um, restraint and seclusion, which has been a process. And we're not wanting to make those changes quickly. It takes a lot of people who are um, part of that process and to make sure that the students are safe, the schools are safe, um, everyone's needs are being met. It's not a flick of a switch to make things happen. So, um, and then, you know, we're still dealing with COVID as well in our district. We're dealing with um, this, the, the guidance, the funds, and how to execute uh, services to students within our district. So, um, I guess I, I know that also at the December 5th meeting, the uh, the weights for this kitchen had come up. And we, I know as a district, have been talking about um, upgrades to that kitchen for a number of years. And I think years past, it was in a bond that didn't pass. Um, and I know that it's just, it's come up again and again, more even before my three year term. So, um, it seemed really modest to do it now when our breakfast and lunches have been increasing and I'm hoping that it will continue to increase. Um, our, our, um, you know, the vote passed a 12 to one and not only will it bring fresh lunches for the students, but it will increase um, it will increase the, the value of the school eventually. So I think also it's important as a unified board to make sure that we're listening to all of the communities and all of the towns and not just you know want the largest town of the district. So oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um I guess you know that's really what I wanted to share. Uh, it, it felt, I felt a little um, taken back with hearing at a public meeting. And I guess that's one of the things that we've had a lot of conversations around, you know, people see you first as a select board um, member versus an individual. And then to have that open discussion and you're sharing your own opinions at a, at a meeting that you're representing the town felt a little, it just rubs me the wrong way, I guess. So, anyway, I think that, you know, I welcome all of you to come to our school board meeting. We have one this week, we have one twice a month, and it was um, at Harwood. So, I can also speak to, you know, the climate at, at the schools. I have a student in elementary, um, in the middle school, and one at the school, and uh, I think the climate there is really, really healthy now. It's in, in a better place than where it was last year and two years ago. So um, I think a lot has to do with my, Dr. Mike being present in the schools. Um, you know, he's visiting one school every single day and has an office at, at the high school. So all the students, a lot of the students know who he is. You know, walks in and I hear from my second grader, oh, so I'm after Mike today. <laughs> so, um, 
Thank you for having us. Yeah, Two quick things. So, from the board's perspective, you feel that you rectify the situation, and I, I probably get some of the issues wrong, but we had a woman elected from Waterway, I think it was just last year, who resigned almost immediately because she didn't have computer access uh, to, to be a board member. And it was a little disconcerting to me that somebody was willing to step up and be a board member, but because they couldn't accommodate the board's desire to have everything electronic, uh, she had to quit. And, and that doesn't seem like it's as inclusive as it should be. Yeah, well, you know, and I think that the same thing goes, it takes a responsibility um, to be a board member. You know, I mean, same if I were a single parent and I couldn't find coverage to watch my children or be at home with them, then I might not be able to volunteer for something. I think there's that. I think also, you know, talking with um, our administrative team at the time, you know, she, she she wanted things to be copied and handed to her and we get inundated so much with so much information that it it just it wouldn't be, and some of the stuff is confidential um and i'd have to reread some of my emails to refresh my memory about um the the computer loaning um and who knows maybe it would be different maybe maybe it would be different under different administrators. Well, I, I do know there are some municipalities out there, one of them is not one of them that actually supply their board members with electronic. And when they're on the board, that's how they communicate. And it would seem that if somebody wants to serve, that it, a computer shouldn't be a barrier. So, I want to recall, um, and also just the, you know, as you said, it's been a while. I know I, I read a lot of what was happening. She was offered a, a, a rent, a rental or a loan, um, what are they, phone books? And it wasn't, it was like not to be forever, it was like for certain. And and so I think that I heard there were offers and negotiations, but it just it wasn't to everybody's, you know, liking. So, you know, and maybe it will be different, but. Yeah. So that was just one question and observation. The second one goes back to our prior conversation. And I hope this does not, it's not meant to be, I'm not, I don't know what the situation is. You know, I've been a municipal manager here for almost 35 years. And until 2018, uh, December 31st of 2017, uh, there was a local police department here. And when I first came to town, the police were uh, often in the schools and they were welcoming the schools. The jail program came in. The jail officer who was working at the, at, at the time that was uh, Dr. Brooke. And we also, even though Crossing Brook was in Duxbury, the village trustees allowed the police officer to work in the Duxbury school. Uh, before the village police department was disbanded, we were told by the schools we don't want police officers in the schools. Uh, uh, not only programmatically, but uh, really don't come here is the message really that we got. I tried to meet with administrators, with the police chief to talk about uh, uh, school issues that revolve around cost. Uh, the school administrators didn't want to have any conversations about it. So I don't know what the climate is now. I know it made an anecdotal statement, but you know, we reported in the paper a couple of weeks ago that the Montpelier police chief brought his child to school in uniform and he was told, don't come on the school grounds in uniform. And he subsequently has resigned his position. And I'm not suggesting. That's the reason why he's us. But anecdotally, police have been a flashpoint in our society since the George Floyd incident in particular. 
but it goes back beyond that. And my concern is that um, if these attitudes really are the attitudes that are being transmitted by the schools, and, and if it is allowed to go that way, it, it teaches kids that the police are the enemy. And I think that's a bad message. So I'm not suggesting that Carl is doing anything bad or wrong. We don't know what the circumstances are. We don't have any local police in any of the six towns any longer, so it might not be as easy. But uh, if if that is kind of uh, a message that's being sent by the educational community, I am with that. I just want to express it. And, and I can't, uh, I've not had extensive conversations and I've not sensed a, 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 any kind of animosity towards police. I'm, I'm the son of a police officer. So uh, in, in my last school, we had a school resource officer in the school. Uh, we had a municipal police and we're also serviced by state police. And I just two weeks ago, I actually met with Lieutenant White and uh, some of the sergeants. So, so I, I also want to have a, a positive relationship because I think it can be a proactive piece as well. But I'm not sure. Of, I'm not sure of the history, but uh, I can tell you that the current administrators of uh, Harvard Union High School are certainly open to working in a positive way. I, mean, with I, would, think I would encourage you to find ways to invite the troopers in uniform to get it. So I think it's a it's a good thing that you. Yeah, we had a good meeting. Thanks. Especially with the staff shortages that you're currently uh, going through, maybe there's some students that are willing to take those challenges on. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I just want to say thank you uh, to both of you. Sorry, my kids. Um, Mark, uh, an important part of our community. I think uh, you're a Waterbury, we're so fortunate because we are one of the larger communities, and uh, because we have. Uh, work together with Duxbury for so long. We have a fairly stable uh, school environment, and I know that it's challenging for some of the other smaller communities that may be losing or the threat of losing their uh, elementary or primary school, which really does define the community in many ways. And parents get together, so kids get together, uh, and uh, a lot of communities feel like that sets their identity. And, uh, so I, I recognize that we have several challenges to uh, uh, but uh, say that uh, we as a select board are here to support you. So please do reach out to us uh, and uh, let us know how we can support you. And good luck with that. Thank you. Everybody's been so welcoming since I've come and I've, I've just enjoyed uh, visiting all the communities in Waterbury. I drive through on, on a daily basis. Uh, but uh, while I'm new to the community, I've been, I've been visiting here for uh, close to 30 years. So I had a daughter graduate from University of Vermont, which is what attracted us here in that, this phase of our life. So I'll just thank everyone for your outreach and hospitality. Thank you very much. Chris, yes, I'd like to talk to you guys for just a second. I appreciate you being here. Um, so at the last meeting, um, I will probably welcome the feathers. Um, with my comments about uh, the handful of times I went to the school board meetings, I found them very dysfunctional. Uh, that was back during the last uh, session or time frame where they were trying to put another bond boat together and switch the school system around and eliminate another school and this, that, and the other thing. I apologize if I um, made people feel uncomfortable and perhaps slighted some people. Um, I probably shouldn't use such a harsh word. I apologize for that. Maybe the, the uh, more appropriate word would be uh, unproductive. Um, I couldn't, in fact, I stopped going because I couldn't subject myself to what I was seeing. Uh, that was probably well before you were on the board, Kelly. Um, and probably some others. Now, I have spoken with several people who were on the school board at one point, um, gotten information from Gulf Forces now, per se, um, and that coincided with what I experienced myself. Um, as I had spoken earlier, I got four grandchildren. <clears throat> I'm not only concerned about my grandchildren, but I'm concerned about all the other young grandchildren. 
that other people have and young people in this community as well. When you're being faced with <clears throat> typically six to 10% year over year budget increases, that starts to frustrate people. Uh, one of the things that I did witness, uh, and it would take some doing to figure out, and then there's going to be a lot of pushback as well, anytime it comes to things like this, is, is, is uh, delving into each one of the budget items. You know, there's a list line, you know, as long as your arm on budget items in the Harvard School budget. Three quarters of the budget costs is sad. Um, your three year proposal, uh, I'll be curious to see what that produces uh, and whether or not there can be any substantial bringing in of um, what I would consider runaway costs. And what bothers me the most is that adults now are making choices that are increasing the cost, not only, and that's one of the reasons I got on this board, to try to keep those offering in and still produce the same goals. Substantially less money. Um, a lot of young children's children to stay in, okay? The jobs in Vermont don't pay the types of wages that can typically keep up with the pace that we're exceedingly getting, you know, over the top on in, in the cost of living. If you look at what's going on right now in so many different sectors of, of the cost of living, uh, education, uh, healthcare, affordable uh, housing, a uh, number of different ones, I could name one, but I'm, I'm trying to talk here, get through this. In, in short. Uh, <laughs> it seems like everything that we do now we're having to throw subsidies at it. That in itself says, says volumes to me. Having to subsidize everything because it's simply can't afford it under the normal uh, you know, mathematics or, or normal case. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we've lost, I've been in the construction industry before. <clears throat> um, we're losing people out of the trades were at, at alarming them, you know, numbers. Um, that's part of the reason that housing costs are being driven up so we don't have the available uh, numbers. Uh, so I would I plan on trying to attend some more school board meetings. Maybe now that the guard has changed, things will hopefully turn in a different direction. Uh, and I know that there is a lot involved in, in it because I've, I've looked through our uh, There's a lot there to try to keep control of, but we have to start being concerned for the future of those young people, let alone the people that have been struggling. And I, and I went to one school board meeting here a while back where we were looking to get rid of a couple of teachers, and it's almost a protest that wanted to keep those teachers on because certain groups school them. Think that we should be doing right one. You know, when I when I first started one of my jobs, I was getting paid as, right out of high school. I was getting paid six fifty an hour. When you start at that wage level, or even at today's current wage level, these the people that are in these rooms that are making wages, these younger people, uh, <laughs> when they get to retirement age, I suspect they're going to be outpaced by. By the people that are coming after them, but here we are well beyond their start. And to try to put away money to compete with that when you get to retirement age is almost impossible. It's just, you know, it's the older you get, the harder it is to earn the money. You can't run faster. And my boy talks about it. I'm getting sick of running faster to try to keep up. And that's what's going on here. And somehow we got to get a new one. Because it impacts a lot of people. They're on the school board or what? I've been here, oh, uh, but, but I would have to go to a few board meetings. <laughs> so, one of the things that I issued that I did have with the meeting was that you hear from the public in the beginning of the board meeting, okay, before any discussions taking place about any of the agenda items, and then you can't hear from them again. 
And I really think you're losing out on a lot of perspective, a lot of valuable information, because as you're going through these agenda items, there may be input from the public that is invaluable to you. That's something you didn't think about. Uh, that's why I enjoy hearing from our public when they're here, when we're going through our agenda items, because they might bring something to the table that none of us ever thought about. And that's probably why all their materials are available online, and that makes for someone to provide comment about any of the issues with you find us. And I think we have the same challenge as has been acknowledged. We've had folks who don't agree with decisions this board has made come to meetings to voice their opinions about it. We've done our best to think about how we proactively gain information in the same way this survey was gaining information about the schools. We just put out a survey about ARPA money looking to gain money. So all I would say is thank you very much for your time. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for serving on the school board. Um, I really appreciated that you did the meeting groups. I wasn't able to make them, but I think you even just coming to our meeting and mentioning that they were happening and when the dates were, I found really useful. I think there's been a lot of discussion, and it'd be both items this far with a lot of individual opinions. And I just think that knowing that both boards are having meetings and that those are an opportunity for dialogue is really appreciated. And again, I think we have raised voting, and just to say that Karen's a town clerk, so that's why she was speaking to that. Uh, <laughs> we hope to stay in communication. So thank you for being um, One very quick issue. Mm -hmm. So we're part of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and it has a whole legislative platform. And maybe this is the way we all, um, because it's come up for a long time, but uh, the LCT for years in their platform has wanted to convert the homestead tax exemption, which most Vermonters get, to a pure income tax component and use that as a means to fund schools. Um, I don't know. I assume there's a there's a DLCT for school districts. Um, it would just be curious to talk sometime and see if their legislative platform and funding schools is the same as League of Cities and Towns. Then it's not nice to know why. I would enjoy having a conversation with that. The school board side of the Vermont School Board Association, and we have a Vermont Superintendents Association as well. So uh, that's one of those areas that generally uh, I, I have not looked recently with the SBA statement is that generally school boards uh, like that mix, that balance between the two. Uh, but I can have to take a look and see what their platform is and have a conversation with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm really excited to see the gold. I, it's really helpful. Um, it's just like one extra level of transparency. There's no one's platform, so that's particularly our person. I was very excited to see. Um, and then as an example of just more communication, I mean, yeah, something we struggle with as a board as well. So I'm excited to see your work there and maybe feel some ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and as quickly, uh, to Chris's point too of technical education, we do have a partnership uh, with the with the technical center in uh, in Barry, and we have this year about 30 students to attend. One of our school board members, uh, Jonathan, who is from Warren, is on that board as well. So that's an area of project education that I think is very important. Uh, we don't have programs in the schools. In fact, my my neighbor and landlord was our last uh, 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 trade building trades teacher. So I think it's an important area, and and we've seen a big drop and the number of students are going to technical education and it's impacting us in a negative way as a society. So that's something that's on my radar uh, and, and it's something that I think on all of our radar. So the, the one school board meeting that I did go to it, it, it was a protest raising this teacher. Um, I went up and spoke uh, in length about several different things. And after that, the, the history teacher, up and thank me for saying what I was saying. Uh, and then the civics teacher, because he, I think, the, if I remember right, it was the history. Teacher. And then uh, the civics teacher came up to me and said, Chris, would you consider coming in to see the students? He said, I would love to have you. And I said, Income. And that never materialized. And it, to this day, it's it, I think I remember that meeting, and I think right after that is when we went into COVID too. Mm -hmm. So that was the last one. Yeah. I believe I remember that so, meeting. So. I'm happy to share that information. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. people.
still interested in that. Is that Allie? I think there's only find their email on the website too. I think all the teachers are listed. You could reach out and offer. Well, I'm not real good on. Um, <laughs> yeah, but you don't want to. <laughs> but yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Bill, for all of your service and welcome to come. So, thanks. Appreciate it. Appreciate you. Yeah. All right. So, our next slide board item will actually be relatively quick. Um, it's just to less, less review in depth and more just sort of announce that we. I finished taking input on the ARPA survey. It has been compiled with big thanks to Tom for being such a spreadsheet nerd. And we have a lovely man. Um, and so it, it was uh, published with the meeting agenda. Um, I think it would be great to have it published with the meeting minute. Mm -hmm. And then um, in the, the world in which I didn't email you in advance to talk about getting it on the website, I don't. Um, so I'll follow up with you, but I would love for people to be able to see. Did I put these. it on the website? Can I, I put it on the I home? I can't remember. I feel like I meant to write feel like, yeah. So I just want to tell the public that it's on the website in case it wasn't on our part. Then there we go. Does that have the Oh, it's like we found in the event. Can I put this on the page under? And that's just the spreadsheet, right? It doesn't have all the. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, and we will continue to discuss next steps as we move forward with budget season, but it was more just an announcement. It can be seen, it can be found. And thank you to the public for your input. Fabulous. Okay, we will move to manager's items. And the first is the Capital Fire Mutual Aid System Communication. Hey, uh, can I just step up and talk to the senior <laughs> center? Joe, are you here? Yes, sir. Okay, Joe Alport. Uh, Deputy Chief and Barry, right? Uh, actually, I'm the interim chief right now. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, nope, not at all. You were Deputy Chief when I last talked to you, I think? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, good. Um, so, I'm not sure how much the select board knows, but Waterbury is a member of the Capital Fire Mutual Aid System, which was established decades ago uh, to help municipalities and um, volunteer fire departments. Uh, at the time, many fire departments were, and some still are, our private, not for profit, home, uh, volunteer departments. But uh, they need to assist each other, especially if they have large structure fires and you're outside of uh, Barry and Montpelier. And even those cities need help from time to time. So that's where the capital fire mutual aid system first came into play. And then since then, um, they provide our discount services for our fire department and for our ambulance. Uh, Waterbury pays this year was about eighty-five thousand dollars, I think, maybe a little less than that. The capital fire mutual aid for dispatching. It was uh, dispatching was uh, eighty-six six hundred in the budget. We spent eighty-seven three forty-one. Next year is probably going to be a little over a hundred thousand dollars, and. Um, in the news every once in a while, you, there, you can come on oh. in the news every once in a while, you may read something about uh, grants from the Department of Public Safety for dispatch and communication. You may have read that the state police is trying to uh, offload some of the dispatching of fire departments that they do in communities that the state police has historically done. Um, and Gary is our delegate to Capital Fire Mutual Aid System, and Joe is here to talk about the mutual aid system communications in particular. So I don't know which one of you wants to go first, but I'll turn it over to Gary. Right now. So, 
just the upfront piece before Joe gets into it, because he can articulate the whole grant piece uh, and the uh, communications piece a lot better than I can. Um, Waterbury has been a member of Capital Fire Mutual Aid going back many, many years, many generations of fire chiefs. Um, it's a great organization to coordinate and um, spend a near with. Um, we've, I, I made the comment at our, I think our last meeting, that I think in the last couple of years, our mutual aid association has been stronger than it's ever been. And I've been going to them for 20 years. So we're moving in the right direction. We have some antiquated equipment and for us as a mutual aid organization to upgrade it, we would never be able to raise the money on our own because it would all be fee based. Uh, so Joe did a tremendous amount of work in uh, helping raise the funds or lobby for the funds for public safety. We I'll let Joe speak to the grant itself, but part of what uh, is required in this grant is for us to have uh, a means to maintain the infrastructure after the grant. We don't want, they don't want to give us the grant and then have us fix the equipment and then a few years down the road not have any money to maintain it. We've talked about it in this board, whether it's current members or past members, that sometimes we don't do a great job of maintaining our infrastructure. And a little bit of money now and then saves money down the road. And I think that's what uh, Joe is really going to talk about. It is going to cost us money as a as a mutual aid organization or member of the organization, but it's money well spent because someday we're going to have to pay for it either way. So Joe is the deputy chief, uh, I think acting chief in Barry City, and I'll let him have at it. Can I ask one question? Sure. Bert? Yeah. So when you talk about upgrades, are you talking about actually upgrading what you have or completely replacing it to, to a new level? I think Joe's going to explain all right. Sorry about that. Thank you, Chief, and uh, thank you, uh, Select Board. I appreciate your time. Uh, my name is Joe Alsworth. I'm the Interim Chief for City of Barrie. I'm also the Vice President for Capital Fire Mutual Aid. Um, the original communication system is about 32 years old. It was originally received as a earmark grant from Senator Patrick Leahy from the federal government, uh, where it was put in place. It had nine towers. Um, and then as we went through the years, um, we were unable, unsuccessful in trying to secure funds to upgrade it. Uh, with that said, we've been trying to figure out how we're going to do this uh, economically and uh, pass the straight face test. Uh, luckily, and, and actually unluckily, the state has to uh, come into a position where they're no longer able to provide dispatching services for free. Uh, due to some shedding of their employees uh, between 60 and 80 percent attrition rate. So they are going to be uh, shedding about 110 agencies. The uh, city of Barry and city of Montpelier provide uh, primary dispatching services for the region, which covers about 700 square miles and about 75,000 people in central Vermont. So basically what we have been working with with the state is uh, how can we assist them and how can they assist us in upgrading our system to become, uh, become more resilient, redundant, and embrace technology? Uh, so the city of Barrie and city of Montpelier are the sole members of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, which they had some money involved there. And the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority paid uh, $36,000 roughly to do a uh, study of the uh, current communication system and offer some upgrade uh, perspectives for that. Uh, with that, they gave us a sixth uh, item list of what to target and to replace. Uh, the, the, worst, the first one was the LMR, land mobile radio system, that is currently on the nine towers throughout the area. Uh, one thing that we were having a problem was that because of federal narrow banding, we actually saw a decrease in the radio coverage in uh, central Vermont, which directly impacted some of the rural communities and they were not able to uh, communicate with each other. This, uh, this in turn created a huge problem. 
Radio systems are affected by three major things, mass, glass, and distance. Mass are the buildings in, in uh, mountains, uh, glass are the buildings inside, like into the basements, and distance between the towers. So that directly affects, and we have all that here in central Vermont. With the study, we we're able to determine to uh, create a more balanced system. Uh, we added three more towers to balance out the system so that the smaller uh, towns had actually received a better uh, increase in their communications, but it also helped the larger communities like yourself in Waterbury with their in-building coverage. So we looked at that. We looked at some uh, public-private uh, partnerships with uh, CB Fiber, Velco, Consolidated, AT&T, and Verizon in conjunction with the state. The city of Barrie and city of Montpelier decided that since the customers that we were servicing should not have to pay for the upgrade of the consoles and the equipment in the dispatch centers, that they took on the $800,000 to do so. With that aspect, we actually became redundant with each other or in the process of that, creating a bridge between each other. So if one dispatch center went down, then we, the other one can take over immediately and provide a, a redundancy, which really didn't have anything in the state, including the state police. So with that said, we offered the state police that it, it would go both ways. So if we had a catastrophic failure in both of Barry Montpelier, the state police could take over for us in an emergency, or if the state police had an issue, we could take over for them. That created a triple redundancy, which was not, not, here, uh, not heard of in the state of Vermont. So that really made us quite resilient <laughs> backup. The other thing that we embraced is right now that the LTE, the cellular coverage in, in the area is not optimal. Everybody knows if you get outside of the major areas, you can't use your cell phone. So what we design, design the system is, is that as cell phone towers emerge and come online, we can integrate and embrace the, fu the future technology into the LMR and really blossom it out. So we looked at how do we balance, how do we do the straight face test and, and make an economical system, but also improve the safety of our first responders. So that's what we did as we came up with the Televate study. As the state was shedding some of their um, dispatch agencies, they came to us and asked, how can we help them out? So as we went through, we said, listen, we have an aging infrastructure that's unreliable. Um, how can you help us so that we can help you? So they created uh, S. 273, it's a bill at the state house that they went through about how to uh, help fund dispatching agencies to, to get back on their feet to absorb the 110 agencies. With that said, we actually, uh, Capital Fire Mutual Aid played an intricate role in assisting the Commission of Public Safety and the ledge ops with creating a, uh, a, a request for funding for the state. And we actually were helped develop the uh, uh, the application process. When doing so, there were communities that didn't have what we had in place. So we had good solid contracts with the city of area, city of Montpelier. We had good uh, redundancy that was already starting to uh, uh, play out. We had training, we had full staff dispatch agencies, and then uh, a number of other things came to light from the governor. One was, okay, we need to have a continuity operations which we developed. Two, how do you do your redundancy, which we developed. Three, they wanted to know that how are we gonna pay for this system once it ages out in 10 years? So with that said, we actually had the, re, uh, the help of your manager, Manager Shepleck, and we developed the uh, spreadsheet that you folks have today. And okay, basically, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Bill loves spreadsheets. We apologize. It's just very, you know, common. It was, yeah. Well, well, well and, and God bless the manager. You guys are very fortunate. He's he's quite the genius with that. And I'm telling you, he, you guys are gonna miss out. Hopefully, you got big shoes to fill there. So, um, so what he did is said, okay, how do we make a fair and equalized uh, proportion over ten years to help upgrade our uh, system at per the direction of the governor. 
Okay. And that's how we came up with that uh, percentage off the equalized grand list. And then he actually went through and says, okay, this is how I would invest it. This is where I invest it, the whole nine yards. So just to be prudent, I took it to a third party vendor and asked them to review that sheet. And they gave it like five stars. It was amazing. So um, that's how we came up with that. That is a separate charge from your current $86,000 a year that you pay for dispatch. <laughs> that is solely going to be for the upgrade and upkeep of the uh, dispatch uh, radio towers and infrastructure over the next 10 years. So hopefully we never have to come back, say, oh, we have to bond again, or we have to increase your rates to that point. Hopefully that this will identify for the long term. It's like saving for a fire truck or a highway plow. We're trying to pay for it uh, in front of it instead of asking for a huge uh, bond vote or, or uh, you know increase into the, the annual allotment. So I think I've talked <laughs> quite a bit in the last 15 minutes. I'm gonna, if I missed anything, Chief Dylan's gonna be able to let me know. And if not, I can answer questions. I think if, if you want to ask questions now is great. If you come up with questions later, you can get them to me and work with Joe and get back to you. So basically what you're telling us is that you're annualizing it out over the next 10 years. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, we're getting the grant and the, the fund will allow us and Bill will be able to more articulately uh, explain his the spreadsheet, but essentially we're saving money to maintain it so we don't have to go back and try and find another grant that probably won't be there um, or have a big increase uh, to pay for a million dollars in one year to, for all the towns. Um, although Waterbury is larger, it's still an increase in cost, but it's the same increase to the small towns as well. So this will save the lump sum monies or bigger lump sum monies down the road. Wasn't so, this a prerequisite to get the grant? You yeah, they wanted help. us to have capital. And, um, I was tasked with creating a spreadsheet. My, my simple uh, math was take the million dollars, divide it by 10 years, divide it by your municipal, by the fire departments, there's how much you pay. And Bill took it and completely reworked it. And we're going to pay actually less, but make money at the same time on different bonds. Um, as well as spending money, but after 10 years, we still have more than what we would have used my spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. That's Bill's magic. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and I'm sure there are other managers that could do that. I am not a spreadsheet guy. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, does that mean that we won't see annual cost increases? No, no I don't. Promising <laughs> correct, right, correct. I mean, there's, there will be normal increases, like we have with the town contracts, but this will prevent the, hey, we need to come up with a million dollars for next year. And that's a huge increase, but so we shouldn't see that, but we'll see, you know, essentially cost of living increases uh, maintain this because we're paying for dispatching service from our, the Montpelier Police Department. They provide, and Barrick City does a, a great job. They have some of them and Montpelier has the others. and. I don't think for the money that we're spending, we're going to get any better. In fact, I know we can't get any better, even if we paid more money. So, and in the final analysis, the way I think of this is, if you look at our 2023 number in the fire budget, 1750 per person, water directly for the cost. For someone to pick up the phone when you dial 911, somebody's going to be there. Mm -hmm. Um, one question I have, I don't know if this is a question for you or a question for Joe. Um, you talked about cell coverage. Um, I know when I met with Quasi, they showed me it's um, things called a mountain rescue team. I'm probably butchering that. No, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, time. If you've got cell coverage and you're on the mountain, um, can that call be triangulated so the mountain rescue team can? Yes. Can find those folks? So when somebody calls 911, the 911 call taker can actually get the gps location they pass it on to the mountain rescue crew and they have gps's and they can actually talk to the person as well so all of that happens simultaneously so that is the one good thing about it um, they did put up a temporary tower 
here in Waterbury, uh, down the complex, I believe. Um, and, you know, I was talking with, because we had problems at the fire station. We did not have cell coverage or internet services. Oh, really sure. Yeah. Yeah. So they have put boosters in our station so that we could actually have unlimited access to our reporting system and other emergency information. But the maintenance guy that came here to install it reluctantly um, acknowledged that the problem is that Verizon, which is the tower right here, contracted out space on their tower to other cell companies. That's why I will miss your so oh, backed up. Even if I don't know how to use them. So it is a problem. Um, nobody wants to see a tower, but everybody wants to see Chief, Chief, of I, Chief of I may. Yeah. So just to add up to that, we we've actually built our system to embrace uh, the build out of uh, LTE technology, which currently is not in place right now. But down the road, as it improves, we would be able to embrace that and interface it with our LMR radios. The problem is, is that they don't make a uh, cell phone that is fireman friendly. <laughs> So, as you know, if you drop your water, your phone into water, you either have to put it in some ice, uh, rice for a couple of weeks or get a new phone. And, and so the, uh, that uh, coupled with the heat that's involved and then the low level of light, it's not really conducive to the firefighters use. So where a portable radio is an immediate hooking to the dispatcher saying, I need some help or I need this happening. So that's why we're looking to improve the LMR system. So there are companies out there that will say that they have cell phones that can actually work as portable radios, if you will. But when you start talking to them about um, accessing them when you're inside a building, when there's when you can't see, you've got to fumble for it out of a pocket and or it gets wet, they, they kind of change the subject and come back around saying, but we use our phones as a portable radio, which is unrealistic at this point. Questions? So, Bill, uh, does this mean that uh, in addition to the 86 or $87,000 uh, each year, we're going to be paying an additional 11659 yeah. going up? Uh, a little bit each year. Yeah. So um the Capital Fire Mutual Aid said that they need to have a million dollars available in the bank after 10 years to be able to um, satisfy the state mm -hmm. and, and look at how this is going. So Gary took a stab at it and he lying at the bottom. Uh, in the middle of this page, it's the total amount built where it starts at 90,425 yeah. and goes to 101, mm -hmm. 122. Right. Jerry had $100,000 every year, and we divided $100,000 by however many communities there are. And if there are 20 communities, it was $5,000 a piece for each community. And, and for water, that was a good deal, but when you look at uh, the size of these towns and their departments and the grand lists, yeah. it's like put it on the grand list. So the first column basically says we'll raise $90,425. There's a particular tax rate applied to the 2021 grand list, and it generates $11,000 for Dutch for water break. Now, just make sure you look at that left hand column. Waterbury is the, an equalized grand list of 10 million 408, but that includes 76% of Duxbury's land area. Mm -hmm. And more town includes 24% of Duxbury's land area. And East Montpelier Mont has 50% of Cowles, and Woodbury has 50% of Cowles. So even though Waterbury's cost to capital fire mutual aid is 11,650,60, um, we have a contract with Duxbury, and Duxbury is paying us over $112,000 this last year. So they will pay their fair share into this. And if you go down below, uh, below one of the Christmas tree colors, uh, where it you know, says uh, it's in white, 
what I basically done is say, well, you're not going to just stick the $90,425 on your mattress. Well, it's invested in something and use gross of interest. These interest rates for T-bills, I did this back in May. Uh, the interest rates are much higher now. So over time, you might get some benefit there. But what this shows is that uh, over the end, there's $956,000 taken in. And I show somewhere in here, and it's been a long time since I've looked at this spreadsheet, but uh, I'm also factoring in, oh yeah, down in the in the in the bottom there where it says stat balance, you see in red it says cost of maintenance. Mm -hmm. I put in in a couple of different years that you're not just gonna have a system that never requires any maintenance. So um I've got I've got thirty five thousand dollars in there. And you know, this is a spreadsheet. You can move these things back and forth. Mm -hmm. So in yellow, what it shows is if all this works out, that the ending balance after 2032 would be a million eight dollars, which is what the state was looking for. Let's show they have a million dollars. And we've actually raised nine hundred and fifty-six thousand dollars and nine hundred and fifty-seven in taxes. So I think it works well, but to your question, Robert, yes, the, the, we just got a our fourth. Well, it's a second quarter bill from Capital West, uh, or third quarter bill, I guess. It's our it's our last bill this year, and in on it they they had a inflation factor that brought a um, uh, bill up to like eighty eight thousand. But then they added about eleven. So it's our our fire department budget this year is going to have a hundred thousand dollars or so for this. Mike, that's Mike, oh, sorry. Mike, go ahead. Mike, go ahead. thanks. Just a question. I'm definitely in favor of this, but painful advocate. If any of the members. Can I just talk over here and picking up? Maybe talk a little bit more slowly. Or turn your video off because then what? Is that okay? There, give it a shot. Yeah, much better. Zap, is, is the audio better? Yes. No? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> keep talking. <laughs> Try my best. Um, just you know, again, I'm all for this, but say if members of the capital district don't approve this, are any are any of the members going to be shut off from this system? Well, no, but I'll let Joe answer that and, and the success rate that we've had in other towns. <laughs> so as of now, we have 100% buy-in to support uh, this project. We actually have a MOU drafted by the Capital Fire lawyers that will uh, have each community uh, pledge into the system that they're gonna they're gonna stay for the ten years. Just so you know, this all this part is this system is partly Waterbury, so you're a part owner now versus having just strictly your customer. Your eighty six thousand dollars pays to keep the lights on. The dispatcher behind the mic 24 7 but this is actually paying for your infrastructure uh, across the 700 square miles for the 75,000 people <clears throat> in central vermont so this is actually partly your system that makes sense yep thanks joe that makes a lot of sense yeah is 35,000 going to be enough and is that 35,000 spread throughout all the district? All the so 35,000 for maintenance? Yeah. Uh, that seems cheap. Well, I don't know. Um, it's a number I threw there. These folks looked at it. Um, so the, the, the answer is I don't know. Um, I think what there's a couple things to remember. One, um, I did put a inflation factor or a multiplier factor into the into the brand list. You can see it's going up 
uh, every year the equalized grain list, but it's one percent. I think that's a low estimate. So if it increases more than one percent, uh, the taxes would be down a little bit. And if we earn more money in interest, then you know we don't have to earn any of the taxes. So everything on this uh, sheet, Chris, is just an estimate. Um, it was show us how we can earn a million dollars after ten years. So. Uh, what they have before I looked at it didn't have any maintenance in it. It was just $100,000 after 10 years, now it's a million dollars. So this is a little bit more um, uh, fine tuned than that, but it's it's all just an estimate. I think uh, the only thing I want to make sure, Joe, you know, maybe you talked about this when I was out of the room a little bit, and maybe you just alluded to it right now. There has been a lot of press. Um, and there's one guy that throws a lot of rocks at Capital Fire Mutual Aid and at the city of Barrie and the city of Montpelier. And I do think it would behoove the district, Joe, and maybe you said something about lawyers. I really think that it would be a good idea if all the members of Capital Fire Mutual Aid System kind of signed a new agreement. Uh, the agreement that put this organization together probably was established in the 50s or 60s. And uh, I think it would be just good to have Capital Fire Mutual Aid have a good organizational structure and a contract. And then there should be a really clean, good contract between Capital Fire Mutual Aid and the city of Montpelier and Barry, whoever does the dispatching. I think the second one. We have a, an existing contract that's better, but the whole organizational structure really needs to be brought up to the 21st century, I think. Yep. So uh, just to, to expand on that. Um, so we have been in contact with our lawyer from Capital Fire Mutual Aid, and we're in the process of, of doing that very such thing. We also have a MOU drafted that will for each community to pledge towards this project. We're kind of locking them in for the duration so that we can keep it as Bill has uh, uh, put out there. Um, we have taken steps to that. That will be coming out at the January meeting. Uh, Chief Dillon will have that back to everybody so that we have, but we do have that in draft form now and we're working towards it. Good, thank you. So who takes care of all the towers? So Burlington Communication is who we work with. So they do the regular maintenance. There's a tower here in Waterbury that um, I don't think is, it, well, it hasn't been moved, but it's it's due to be moved literally any time and they do that. So they're moving it from one location to the WDEV tower on Blush Hill. Um, so there's a minor cost to that. So there are ongoing annual costs, but you know, they, and is that in our typical dispatch line item? So that's paid. That's paid for with the money that you're paying mm -hmm. capital fire. We pay the capital fire seven thousand. Right. Yeah. That's so we don't pay that afterwards. You're we're paying so that we can pay for it. We pay this for the service. It, it gets us, as Joe said, somebody behind the, the console, and then they take care of all of the operational costs. But just to put it in perspective, you know, if you could get somebody to be a dispatcher and only pay them twenty dollars an hour to do it, there's twenty four hours a day, there's three hundred sixty five days a year. That's that's one hundred and seventy five thousand two hundred dollars just for that. And there's no benefits, there's no unemployment, or just call, no you know, <laughs> no money to take over when you're on vacation. So, I mean, dispatching for our fire department, if we had to do it ourselves, it would be a half a million dollars, I guarantee it. Uh, so this is a bargain, any way that you slice it. And I think it will be a better bargain once all these upgrades are made, because we can provide redundancy, as Joe said, uh, and uh, it will uh, provide coverage. We have pretty good coverage in Waterbury. I don't know if there's too many places in town that they go that they can't get that coverage. But this will also be protection for the firefighters, too, I assume, right? This is a huge increase in, in personal safety for those. 
folks that do this job. So there are a couple, what we refer to as dead spots. Um, unless all of our people are there, if there's a couple, there's one spot on um, Guffle Road that if a truck tries to call um, another truck on the way to a call, you can't hear them. It's a, it's a dead spot. But if we're all there, we can talk because we can talk on our portable radio. So it's not a, a big issue. Um, the other dead spot is the state office complex. Um, it's a big dead spot. And this system will help facilitate our ability to communicate inside that building. Um, so it's inside the building. Where it's, it's inside the building. building. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of steel and concrete. And, and fortunately, we haven't had anything serious here. We've had some motors burn up and stuff. And uh, their maintenance crew has an antenna there. So usually they're with us if we deem it safe enough for them to be with us. So they can actually help communicate. Um, but this system will help with that. It's just a problem down there. And in, in, in any other town that has mountainous areas, there's some dead spots. Thank you. Okay. Do we need to do, do we take action? I think it would be good if you took action to at least support this. Uh, this is the direction that we're going. In. In terms at some point you'll have an MOU to consider and maybe a new um, new sign up sheet, if you will, for capital financial aid. But I think you should at least make a motion tonight to include the uh, hundred whatever thousand dollars was in the in the fire budget, which would include this this model. <laughs> uh, I'll move that for. Um, Select so board support uh, this plan to support capital fire mutual aid uh, renewal infrastructure capital replacement plan. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for your time. All great. Thank you, Joe. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, just, just like to say thank you very much on behalf of the Capital Fire. And also to reminder to uh, the manager that the annual appointment <coughs> to the Capital Fire Mutual Aid should be made uh, in January. That would be your chief. Okay. Thank you. Nice. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. I just want to say quickly if Capital Fire is going to go around and get 27 pounds to sign that on you, then the HR argument and dispatches have paid for it. And this is the grand list. Um, some, some small towns will love that. Um, some towns will want per capita. Some towns say per capita doesn't make sense if I mean goes to our community because so many calls are generated by that. Mm -hmm. So there's no perfect way to do it. You just have to pick your lane. I think it's pretty fair. If I if I may, the uh, every town I've been to, I've been to all 20, all supported this funding mechanism. Oh, that's great. Based on the ground list? Yeah. Yes. Sir. That's fantastic. Thanks for all your work on this, Joe. And, and just to key on what Tom said, though, the the eighty-eight thousand dollars that we will pay just for dispatching, mm -hmm. this plan is for the you know maintenance of a new system. The eighty-eight thousand is a combination of calls and deadlifts, mm -hmm. so it it's used to try to balance out all of the issues that Tom alluded to. It also includes. Water brand. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we we consciously pay water we mm -hmm. so, Anyway, I think it's well covered the, the whole hundred and whatever thousand of pay formula for Okay. Uh Tom's actually gonna read the truth this one. Yeah, we can kind of focus on me at least so as Tom has done finish the work on it. And we've gotten the detail. I gave him Gary the the detail on the equipment. Yes, I I, I don't have it in front of me because I left the house <laughs> needed to get to the fire station for something and I didn't bring them. I, I, I pretty much know what's on it. 
Um, before I go through any detail, the, the bottom line has, after the revenues, has a net change projected right now of a little over eight thousand dollars for the town. So about one tenth of one penny on the tax rate. Um, and there'll be some adjustments to now when it's final. But the first note is um, the $125,000 for the Duck Bay Fire Contract is a little high. I went and actually emailed them today and estimated that number. Um, we don't have a final number. It's based on last year's costs and then the relative percentage of the grand list. Um, so we have last year's costs pretty close, and I mailed that, emailed that to them. We don't have the equalized grand list, but to the extent our grand list changed, theirs likely changed to the same proportion. So that number is closer to 120. Um, so that's probably a little bit high on the revenue side, but uh, you've got the men when you're talking about more town. More town's probably a little bit low. So no, no, no significant change. <laughs> um, I just want to note on the pay side, um, Do work extent is simply determined based on calls and what happens in the field. Um, but we are assuming that uh, there's a there's a five percent pay increase historically that occurs in April first. Or uh, the pay increase occurs in April first. So for now, I've got five percent plug in. Um, inflation over the past year has been closer to eight. It's coming down a bit. Um, eight strikes me as a really tough number. Um, I know the folks in the fire department don't do it for the money, um, but I still think you've got to, you've got to pay your volunteers a bit more each year when they show up. I think it's fair. So 5% is the number I've looked in. Have to have a conversation about that, but I, I think that's a reasonable place to start. Um, the big number is a dispatching number, and then we can tweak that, but um, the reason it's lower than what you saw before is because it's a fiscal year issue, I believe. So I think that's the right number. Yeah, the 92 860s, we're on a calendar year budget. That the financial aid is on a July 1st to June 30th budget. So we will pay the first two quarters of all of 2023 at the current rate, and then the last two quarters of 2023 will the So so this plan doesn't kick in until July. Or no, this, this this plan, right? This plan kicks in July. So the uh, um, so it could be actually even a little lower than that. I'm not sure exactly when they're going to drill the eleven thousand dollars, whether it's going to be quarterly or whatever. But uh, I, I believe this number will be close to accurate. So it, it's. A little lower than we talked about a minute ago because we're two quarters behind them in terms. So then going forward, will our budget line item match that large graph that we looked at? No. Okay. Because, because of the fiscal year. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd like to go down a little bit to vehicle maintenance, uh, which is an increase. And I just want to talk about that a little bit. And part of that is plan service and the testing um, on the vehicles. Um, we have a vacant mechanics position at Public Works. Um, I tried to talk to the highway department about that. Um, they said they would open up and talk to me. Um, the individual drivers were kind of agnostic about whether we feel that as a driver or whether we feel as mechanics. Um, Celia in the highway department was pretty adamant that she wanted a mechanic in there. She thought that it had a lot of value. Um, and we were leaning that direction. And then in talking to Gary, Gary educated me on the on the value of the mechanic at his department. I didn't think of it as a public works position. Um, Gary talked about all the preventive maintenance, the inspections, and all those trips to Clark Truck Center that are saved. Um, well, it's not Clark's anymore, whatever it's called. Um, <laughs> So uh, the job after the mechanic will go out probably tomorrow. I think it's on the website already. Mm -hmm. um, um, I tried trying to artfully advertise it as saying that we want someone full time, but we'll take what we get. So if we get someone half time, we'll be pretty happy with that. Um, 
So hopefully we can control those costs over time that Gary made it pretty clear that if we don't have anything else to panic that there's you know a tight office and it's going to go up on this side of the shop. Right. So, so we don't have a we don't have a shop, but we don't have paid people and it's nothing them versus us, but say the highway system, their workers could grease their own trucks. They have the equipment there. They can do some oil changes if they needed to. We don't have that. Um, so that means it's it's two hundred dollars just to drive it in the back door um, in Underhill. Uh, so that's the increased cost for me on, on our budget. And so you're you saying that we can do, do the maintenance of the fire. We already do. We already do. Yeah. Well, we, when we have them, we can't do it. And, and just so everybody knows, uh, the vehicle maintenance line uh, here, uh, you know, we looks like we're going to spend about $24,000 this year. Um, some of that money is actually paid to the highway department. So, uh, and what we're saying is paying the highway department uh, for the town highway mechanic is a lot cheaper than yeah. paying yeah. the yeah. yeah. All right, thanks. I mean, that means that I'm not fully confident we can find a mechanic. Uh, and it's, it's a hard job to advertise for. If you look at job ads for mechanics, they range from 18 bucks an hour to 120 grand a year for the Nissan. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll hope we get some good applicants and we'll go from there. Um, well, let me ask another question now. Sure. There's going to be a uh, double duty position. In other words, candidates aren't going to be here. So in their off time, their yeah. job is going to be required to fill the loads. Yeah. Time and so something else. In the job description, if we can find someone full time, we're looking for a mechanic who's also got at least a class B CDL, so they could they could help out the highway crew. So yeah. Eric, Eric Boston was our last mechanic, and Eric had a CDL. He's a member of the highway crew. He he bought, um, and then he he did mechanical work for the highway department, our department, the law department, to the department of E five and even for the recreation department. So the mechanic position services all the vehicles in the town and and all those departments pay uh, a revenue to the to the other department to do it. And I think if I'm my conversations or listening to Tom and Bill Woodward talk and see is that that would be the idea to get somebody who's going to work full time and do that full job, uh, which will not be 24, I mean, not 40 hours a week of care for, because we don't have 40 hours a week of care for. The next step back would be well, if you find somebody that's a good mechanic and says, I'm willing to work three days a week and be a mechanic, I don't want to drive a snow uh, plow, that might be something we have to do because it's part time. Save, it could save money. Yeah, it would be, it would be a part time thing that would be. Ideally, for me, it would be a future. Somebody, I would be really happy if whoever this mechanic, yeah, this mechanic is actually knows pumps um, because. We, we currently have a, a vendor that comes down and he's actually his company's the one that sold us the last five trucks he has a couple of mechanics that work for him so when we have a, a pump related issue or an electronics issue with the fire trucks um, beyond regular mechanical um, electronics meaning radios and starting systems um, they will send them down but if eric used to build fire trucks so for him to dig into a pump was second nature. Um, a lot of mechanics aren't going to be able to do that. You talk about the water pumps, the water pumps, the water fire trucks, the, the pump water trucks. Uh, so you know, you, you blow some gas, you blow gasket on one of those pumps, yeah. it's out of service. So then we got just a big paperweight sitting in the building until we can get that fixed. Eric could climb in there and fix that quickly. 
um, a regular mechanic um, probably won't be able to do that without a lot of load in the system. Yeah. In, okay, so what you're telling me is that this this position may not even cover all aspects but, of your well, I think initially it, it won't if the person doesn't know fire policy. But that doesn't mean that that person can't learn. We've got a couple of people on our department. One of them now works for the town, which I'm happy about. Um, Kyle Guy, he really, uh, although he's not a, a classified mechanic, he knows pumps and he knows how to work on pumps. So that is something, you know, and I don't want to get into who does what within the town. It's not my thing. But if the town hired a mechanic and something needed to be done on a pump, Kyle could go down and show him this is what you need to do. Assuming everybody is okay with that. Doesn't mean that Kyle would do the work, but he could guide that person through it. And that would save us from having to have a guy come down from St. Albans and charge us a lot more. Not St. Albans, it's really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I want to add is, when you're when you're volunteers, the the quality of maintenance of equipment really impacts the esprit de corps. I'm currently up to a thousand firefighters, and when you do that, eventually you impact your numbers, um, and that's what you can't afford to do. Um, when you're being, when you're getting paid, you can drive a lousy truck for a while, and you're still getting a paycheck. Uh, but it's a little different in the fire world. I think. Well, we've done a good job of keeping up with our equipment and maintaining it and getting the fire department. That's why we've got the fire. So yeah, we you know we do maintenance at on each truck once a month. So the first Tuesday of the month, maintenance is at Main Street. That means that the truck is pulled out, everything is checked, everything is started. Anything that will start or gets plugged in gets plugged in or started. Um, the Fluid levels on the trucks are all checked. Everything is done that night on that truck. I then send, when we had a mechanic, send uh, Eric and Celia an email saying, here's what happened at maintenance night. Nothing that's a priority. Here are a couple of things that, when you have two or three more things at Main Street, add this on. Um, if there is a priority, then I put that as a priority. And Celia would work with Eric and he would get right on it. If, if it meant the truck was down, the truck is down, and that's a problem. Um, and then on the third Tuesday, we have maintenance at Maple Street. So we have very in-depth maintenance once a month. You know, you could say, well, it should be done every week, but you're dealing with volunteers that aren't getting paid necessarily to go down once a week and do all this work. A lot of work is being done by the members, um, and nobody really pushes back. Um, you know, somebody might make a comment while they're working on a, a, a saw, uh, I'm the mechanic for the day, you know, it's, it's lighthearted stuff, um, but that's what they do. And, you know, you, you're not paying them to do that, but we want to make sure that that saw works. Yeah. You got a good turnout at the maintenance meetings? Yeah, so it's broken down. We have... Um, we have two training companies. So on a training night, we have officers and firefighters that are company one and company two. And they train on their own things on that night. And about quarterly, they work together on a bigger training event. So those companies, so let's say training company one on the first Tuesday of the month, which maintenance would be down here, half of that company does train uh, maintenance down here. The first half of company two does maintenance at Maple Street later that month. Company one second group does maintenance the next time down here. So we split it up. Everybody's encouraged to go, especially new people, because that's how you know what stuff is. Because you know, when I'm when we're at a fire scene or a crash and I ask somebody to go get me something, my expectation is they get it. Sometimes I don't take into consideration that they're brand new. They just started last week and they don't have a clue what a windshield saw is. So um, by going there, they get paid for one maintenance a month. So if they go to both, they're only getting paid for one. Um, but it, it helps them learn the equipment, know where it is, and how to learn it, how to start. 
Um, on the equipment side, there's uh, with the bottom of the first page, there's 82,500 in new equipment. Um, Gary, do you want to walk them through some of the? I think we can get I got it right here. Um, so, yeah, a lot of this is same stuff um, that we have every year. Um, hope. We anticipate that we are going to lose some holes during this annual inspection. So, we have a company come in out of Connecticut. They come in, and in one day, they test every piece of hose that we have, thousands of feet. And we anticipate that we will use a certain number of lengths of hose, 50 foot lengths of hose, um, during that inspection. We also anticipate that at a fire, we may lose some because it's getting dragged through a house and it gets run over now. And we haven't had a, a working fire moderator for three years until two weekends ago. Um, and we had a, a big large fire, um, and, but we didn't lose anything. But we could go to a shed fire and lose two lens holes because it ruptures. Um, so we put in the budget roughly five thousand dollars each year. Now that buys less and less holes, but we have lost less and less holes during the inspection process. Um, SCBAs; those are air packs um, that the firefighters wear. Um, they're pricey, but they allow us to go in the building in hazardous environments. Um, how long do they last? So they will last um, 15 years, but they get inspected every year. That's part of the NFPA requirement. Inspect the air packs. So we have a company that comes in and they literally will pull one truck out and we have somebody with them that's literally just running air packs back and forth. They run the pack and all the masks through their testing system to make sure that they're functional. Um, a number of years ago, before we merged, the town of Waterbury Fire Department got a grant and they got a, a got rid of one truck that was just a nightmare, um, and a, as well as a mini pumper, and they bought a new mini pumper and they bought a bunch of air packs. And the one that really hurt us the last few years was the number of air bottles they bought. The problem with air bottles is they date out. It doesn't matter how well, you're taking care of them. You could have a brand new one in the box. Ten years later, it is no good. Uh, so when you buy 35 bottles at one time, 35 bottles are no good at one time. So for the last few years, we had been, uh, well, last couple of years, we actually made a, a strides in getting the air packs back. But we sacrificed the newness of air packs even though NFPA said they're aged out, but we still tested them and the company said they were still safe. So we used them because we had to buy bottles because we can't use them. Once they age out, they just cannot be used. So we were able to restock our air bottles over the course of about four years. And that puts us in a better cycle down the road. Uh, replacing them as opposed to trying to replace 35 or 80. Uh, so that's that piece. Um, Are they the associated equipment? That or is, or the associated or? equipment is the masks, the the voice amps, so that we're all on the phone close here. That's so fun. Oh. Yeah, it's so much fun. Did um, you that? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a little, it's like a, a, a microphone that hooks onto the side of the mask, it gets turned on, and then you can actually have an intelligent conversation with somebody inside of hope. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just saying, you're saying the air packs, so is that in gear? I just want to know where. I'm sorry. These the air, air bottles, bottles that you've now given, are they so, in gear? What line are they? So they would come out of the um, SCBA. Oh, so it's the, all in that. So the, the, okay. air, the air pack unit and the bottles come out Thank of there. You. And the, the masks, they're expensive. The voice amps are actually, aside from the air pack itself, are the most expensive piece. Um, and then there's webbing because people put them on and they get wet and they get frozen and they wear out. And you know, it, it might only be $20 a set, but that adds up. Um, so there's that, the gear. Um, again, the fire gear ages out. Some members, 
it wears out. Um, members that are around a little more often and are actually more active in going in and working fires. Um, you know, the, the Kyle Guyat, the Stan Morris, the Sally Dillon, that they're, they're there most of those fires and they wear their gear out to the point that it's really not financially uh, smart to keep fixing it because you end up with patches all over it and eventually the company will say no we can't put any more patches on it so their gear might get turned over quicker than say mine uh, mine goes 10 years I, I for the most part don't get dirty um, unless uh, I happen to you're real good or uh, yeah. <laughs> because uh, my role is a little different but I you know I tend to wear air packs only when uh, we have a fire in stove because I don't have to go up and be in charge of anything so I can go up and I can play, as we say. Um, but that's, you know, a rare event. Um, my people don't let me do that. So, but, you know, Bob Grace is a great pump operator. He's very involved and he's great at running the pump. His gear will not get worn out, it will age out. So each year we buy a certain number of pants, certain number of coats, a uh, certain number of hoods, uh, boots, uh, we have a, a, another spreadsheet guy. Uh, he's one of my officers, Ryan Foster. He literally has every piece of gear on a spreadsheet and with the dates and the serviceability of it. And the year before it's due to get replaced, his spreadsheet for that section turns yellow. And the first of the year it turns red. That person's getting that new coat that year, um, even if it's still serviceable. We don't throw them out. We keep that serviceable gear for brand new people that join um, because they're not going into a burning building, they're not going into a hazardous environment. So they can wear this gear that NFPA says you can't wear into a building. They're not going in. Um, they're expensive. Uh, a coat is a little over $1,600. Uh, pants are uh, somewhere around eight, eight fifty. Boots are Four hundred and fifty um, helmets are over three hundred. So gloves are eighty five dollars for a pair. So this is not like it was when I started. Uh, you bought a pair of um, your own gloves that you might want to wear because the gloves that the department issued you were those orange rubber coated gloves. And if you went to a chimney fire, the chain eventually starts sliding through your gloves because it's not going to uh, stuff. We've, we've come a long ways. Um, we have really good uh, gear. I have great people that take care of this stuff for me. My equipment officer, uh, Ryan, will come to me at the first of the year and say, here's my proposal for what we need this year. And I essentially just go through it real quick, look at it, talk with him, say, all right, who, we've got a little bit more money left over. So who's on the bubble for next year? Let's maybe, get rid of, get them new gear, and then we can use their current gear that is still good as backup in the event that something happens. So we try and do that. If somebody's close to a, a year or two of getting needing gear, but it's still serviceable, if somebody goes to a fire and they, their gear gets totally trashed, not destroyed, but trashed, they can't wear that to the next call. Um, so they will put on a set of used gear. It might not fit. And it's amazing when you get these new people in here. This is not long enough. I, my pants are a little short. It's like, you know what? I didn't have pants when I started. I had to pull up boots. So I don't want to hear complaints. Fine. Uh, the engine command boards, it's we have those in our two newest engines. And what we're finding, in it, what it is, is when you power the truck up takes about three seconds to tell people to get in, push the button to turn the power on, then hook up your seat belt. By then the power is up and running and you can now start the truck. And it has the entire command system of that, what's on that truck. The seat belt connections tells you it's not seat belted, tells you what lights are on. What we are finding because of technology, it used to be the driver would just get in, flick a switch, lights came on, you hit a button, siren came on. That's not the case anymore. Um, 
there, there's a board. And what I found, what I've been seeing over the last couple of years is the drivers are now looking at this board. And because we're going to be in the left-hand lane of the interstate, so they want to put the arrow board to have cars go into the right-hand lane. And that's not what they should be doing. They shouldn't be looking at a panel. They should be looking at the windshield uh, and at the mirrors. So we're, we're getting secondary control panels for the officer's side of each of those two trucks. And it's then that officer's responsibility to run that whole truck and the driver just drives. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, they're $6,000 a piece. <laughs> but what's a truck going to cost us, or what's a, a person going to cost us that steps out because the driver's looking down? Um, miscellaneous items literally could be anything. It could be little straps for the gloves, and it could be anything. Flashlights, um, you know, believe it or not, the flashlights um, are about $75 to $85. But they're intrinsically safe. You go to the hardware store and get a flashlight, and you turn it on in a gas environment, and you're going to realize real soon that you made a mistake. So our our flashlights, our radios are intrinsically safe. We can actually communicate, um, not have to worry about it. Nozzle, we haven't bought any nozzles for a while. We've had it on the budget a few times, but they've always we've always been able to fix them, and maintain them. Um, but we have some that are getting old and we have to fix them on a more regular basis. So we're going to start replacing nozzles this year. Uh, Maple Street computer. Uh, the one that is up there is probably 10 years old. Um, very slow. Uh, SuperVac uh, V3 power control ventilation saw. Yeah, it's a chainsaw on steroids. It's for venting loops and walls and stuff like that. So that's really the, the new equipment, communications. We always have portables on there, pagers. These are, I won't say throwaway items, but eventually when they start getting old. Um, and we are using them a little bit less than what we used to because everybody has iPhones or smartphones and we, we all have two apps on our phone. They aren't as quick and they don't report what the incident is as quickly. Um, but I also, for the most part, I carry a pager when I'm snowballing and along along because it actually vibrates better than my phone. Uh, batteries are a problem um, that we have to replace radio batteries. Uh, I don't know how far you want me to go down this list, but I can certainly okay. answer any questions. It's one of our questions about any of the items. No, 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 I mean, no, I appreciate all the detail on the items. I'm uh, just noting we've got the 18,500 here on new equipment, 85,000 uh, for uh, planned capital expenses. Um, and that's a different item. So it's, it's, so it's a different budget. Okay. So we transfer the budget, we have in here $26,000 for the capital fund. Uh -huh. and, that, and that fund, we show capital expenses. But so one of those items, would be Gary's uh, the, the scuba cascade system. Okay. So the difference between those two would, would be potatoes. Um, the two mm -hmm. So the cascade system that we have, it, um, we started getting parts for it um, at a place called GE. And they had a compressor that they didn't use anymore. And uh, the management there asked one of our officers, we worked there at the time, someone saw it, um, if our fire department could use that. And because at the time we had to bring our air bottles to Montpelier. So if we had a fire at night, we actually had to go to Montpelier to fill, fill our bottles. We'd wake somebody up, always made them happy. So they, could, so they would let us in the building so we could go down and fill our bottles. So. 30 years ago, we started putting that together and it's been piecemeal for a number of years. And it, it's just not feasible to keep piecemealing it. Um, yeah, so it is expensive, but we'll be able to fill two bottles at once and a lot of them. So just on that note, Roger, um, tonight we're just looking at the operations budget for the fire department and the operations budget for the fire department. 
Well, if you're doing some January, there'll be discussion about the capital, etc. What the, the thing to remember now is that this operations budget has that transfer that Tom talked about that goes to capital. And then from there, we pay that transfer. Okay. And then I think the other important thing tonight is the the total expenses of 830,000. Um, I think now on the new day, that number might change a little bit. Um, you know, we get numbers from the League of Cities and Towns about our workers' comp costs and insurance costs, and we might allocate those across the department to different regions. There is mm -hmm. not an impact on the budget, but it might change from one department. Um, I mentioned the revenue. I don't think it's going to change substantially mm -hmm. at all. Does the set the first reward from fire contracts at the end? Tom's already talked about that. Great. Did I send you this? Or is that a little more down? Yes. So at the first point, it's either you don't do level playing or you do. And if you do, you get like $700. If you don't, you get for the I'll, I'll contact the chief over there and, and ask him what their plan is. I've been waiting. I knew that they you gave me this and that they had it, but I don't know if they've made a decision. <laughs> the select board, the select board was very happy with the proposal. And I think that they would do it. It's really uh I'll work out uh, stuff that is who you gotta work out with. He was just sort of about, I guess Middlesex doesn't know, but Middlesex he's worried about being nice. Middlesex seems to me not to do these all that while. So I presume everybody knows where Lover's Lane is. Uh, Just the side of the bridge. Yeah. So we used to cover that long before we had agreements. <clears throat> and then when we had these agreements, and then Middlesex said that they wanted to be able to cover that and uh, and calls it the landfill, which we were happy to give them because at two o'clock in the morning, somebody driving down the interstate sees that gas oh, yeah. yeah. We have to go now. It, we know what it is, but the one time that you don't go, yeah. it isn't. So two o'clock in the morning, we're going down to make sure that it's a methane gas burn off. So we're happy to give that to Middlesex, but then they'd stop going, so we're going again anyways, and so. Um, Stephen, the fire, Stephen Pratt, the fire chief, asked me if we would cover it to Lover's Lane. This is Moortown. Moortown's fire chief in Moortown. Um, I said that we would. Um, he's just got to be able to go to the Middlesex fire chief. And, and their department literally is around the corner. But they're going to, and you know, I don't begrudge them at all. They have what they have. But they're going to show up with a person in a personal vehicle. And then maybe a fire truck with one person. And in that same amount of time, we're going to show up with six people ready to go in the first truck. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have a tank truck, and then another tank truck, and then another engine coming down through, and then a rescue truck. We're going to plug the road um, for people to live there. So we can provide <laughs> better protection than what Middlesex can, just because of our numbers and equipment. But I think what we'll do then, uh, until Jerry tells us different, try and get that tomorrow. On the revenue side, we'll use the 3525 from Wartown until Jerry tells us we've got on the plan. So it, it's possible that 3525 goes in the budget as a revenue, and then we have to get to 700. But I think you should know it. If you're going to talk about it tomorrow, um, Hopefully, yeah, Gary, do you see that changing now in the future? Could we possibly handle more more town? Um, I don't know that we would handle more more town. Um, we cover Cobb Hill, uh, which the majority of that is more town, right. and we cover Route Two. Um, Duxbury goes all the way to more town, the other side of Harwood. Yeah, more town um, is. I mean, once you cross the bridge at Lovers Lane, then you're in, in Middlesex for quite a ways there. And by the time you go down to 100 feet and get back, it's kind of close enough to the four town fire station. Um, we do go um, just because of the, the cost of the building. Um, 
we are Waterbury is now the primary response to Harwood, but Moortown and Waitsfield also gets called. Um, a number of years ago, there was a, an actual fire there, and Moortown went and got there and then called for help. And it, it's it's a long ride over there. Uh, so now Waterbury is the primary, with Moortown and Waitsfield being secondary, so that we can all go at the same time. Typically, when when we get there, we we take over and take command. Um, it's, it's nothing against anybody there, but we have a, an established structure that we use, and there's the structure that's used nationwide, and that's what we do. So, uh, right. thank you. Sure. And I'll open it up that if anybody wants to come to our stations, give me a holler. Thank you. Lots know, of you know, well, good questions for the chief. Not for the chief okay. or um, whatever administrator officer, and I regret asking this now. Um, I'm quoting out of June 20th minutes that W. Shuffle has suggested line items in the town budget should show the income received and expenditures from the CC Fisher Fund. Is that reflected? Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Oh, you did a great job, buddy. All right. So <laughs> the CC picture fund is not in what we have in front of you tonight. Oh, but it is. It is. Um, it is here. So right. But my question is just for the. Uh, so it's not relevant to the budget under discussion tonight. It's, uh, well. <laughs> Any expenditure from the CC Fisher Fund has appropriate revenue from somewhere else, so it doesn't impact the tax rate at all. In the general ledger, the CC Fisher Fund is listed here. Tom just didn't put it on his sheet. So okay. this will be updated and it will be Great. That's my question. But in uh, 2020, Two, there's about $3,200 spent in the CC Fisher Fund that will show up in the budget. And that will be something that Duxbury you know, is part of our total expenditure. But we have a revenue coming from the CC Fisher Fund that will offset our expense. So, right. Okay. Right, my question was just, I thought the goal was to have it reflected. It my is. question is, okay. Yeah, right, thank you. That was awesome. Planning department budget. Okay, hello. Oh, you're paying for it. Yeah, I'm just going to that clock before the meeting, and I think we agreed to get here at like 7.30. So that's fine. Okay. You know, it's all a good education. All by two hours. Yeah, don't worry at all. That's fine. So, um, does everybody have the... And here that I'll um, give you a minute to find yeah, the uh, planning department budget, and there should be a um, justification, which is a uh, uh, three page document that goes through each one in any more detail. And um, so I think, being as late as it is, I think I'll work off the spreadsheet. And then um, there's also a um, work plan, and uh, this is something that um, this, excuse me, this last year due to COVID uh, wasn't included in the packet, but we've included it again. And um, it's I uh, CC Neil as well, so uh, my colleague, and um, gone over the budget with him as well. So we're making sure to keep him in the loop. So I don't, I don't think the. Uh... Yeah, we have a budget and we have a work plan. I thought we have it around start. Okay, so it looks like this. If you, um, when it's I had given, given you Tom, uh, we had in the room, so it's in there. Okay. Yeah. What does it look like? It says planning department budget oh, yeah, and justification is underlined. I thought I. I thought I paper clipped it to everybody. So if you're missing it, all I have here is fire protection contracts. We have to adjust the work Yeah, that's a justification that is a companion to the budget. Yeah, these were these were here. So I put them in the menu. So, which I call it, I found here. Here. 
Here's the death bar here. Yeah. Bill, this is what is it? Do you get what? You don't have one. Do you need a copy? I'll do it. It's double signed. Yeah, just double signed. Yeah, yeah. Great, thanks. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and get started. I just like, and um, so um, Tom will help me here a bit with the K items. Do you want to start from the top? Sure, let me just um, go ahead. Do you want to introduce them? Sure, I can do okay. it. So on the revenue side, the planning for the projections for what we're seeing this year. Um, the bylaw modernization grant. Um, so we're budgeting, assuming that the grant is awarded. So it's a $25,000 grant. There's a 10%, $2,500 local max. So down below, there's $27,000, 500 in expenses. Um, just something more appropriate to budget all the all the cost all the expenses and revenues versus just the net. Mm -hmm. um, the regular pay is, I think, a pretty reasonable estimate. Um, you know, we're assuming um, the backfill is these positions at a little bit of a salary reduction. Um, and then we've got a zoning administrator, and we, you know, we essentially we we have one backfill at a minimum, and potentially two, and uh, we backfill. Um, so there's some some changes there. Um, so the 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 regular pay and the zoning administrator are going to be subject to some change. Um, I don't think change between necessarily between now and town meeting, but the this the situation on the ground might just warrant what occurs there. Um, what is the planning to retire in March, the middle of March? And are we planning any overlap? Um, we've had a little conversation about that, and it depends on Steve to some extent. And yeah, and I've offered to stay on part time. If you don't fill the mm -hmm. second position as a transition, so that's another possibility. Thank you. Thank you. And so, for the health insurance, for example, we we assume the new hire would take a two-person plan, which is essentially the average cost plan between us and white families. But that person takes a single plan, or it's it's an independent plan. There's kind of questions. We'll just have to take it there and then work with it as the year goes on. Um, otherwise, there's nothing, um, nothing major being planned uh, in terms of changes in this budget. Um, um, it's very much uh, very similar to our year, and the the net cost, the net impact on property taxes is actually down a bit. Um, I believe that's because in prior years there were some uh, special funds appropriated um, for the parks planning study that were strictly town funds. Correct. So in essence, we're returning to a bit of a normal year without those funds injected. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. The other piece I, I just had to mention quickly is at the very bottom we have um, Vitalize and Waterbury. They'll be in here on their own for a budget meeting, uh, but they have uh, told us they're not going to request an increase in funding this year. Do you want to talk about specific line items? Yeah, I would. I would. <laughs> so there's not a lot of changes. From last year, uh, we'll start with professional services. Uh, this is the item that we use for uh, paying the secretarial services. And um, you'll see the change from 2022 of uh, 1,450. Uh, that's for the Ferrars Edition Historic Survey. This is a project that was initiated by uh, the uh, Way back when we had building trustees but the e fund and um so we're working trying to get that project finished uh we've had some issues with a consultant and um so we can add that uh 1450 back in to the budget um uh, because we really do need, we're probably going to have to get into some legal action on that we have a contract amendment that allows us to follow through with some legal action if we need to 
So that's that's a head up heads up on that. Okay, so uh, we're we're starting with professional services. Well, so I'm sorry. So we are doing. We had a consultant um, study that started back in 2019 with uh, one of six associates to do a historic district survey of the forest addition out beyond. Um, Crossroads Beverage in the post office, that historic area. He's been here to do the PowerPoint presentation. Basically, dropped the ball on finishing the project. So, we we had retained 1,450 out of a 10,000 plus contract, um, but we don't have the final product. The project's not complete. So, we have a contract amendment that uh, was, signed by all, was signed by all parties this past summer. To finish the project and so it would allow us to um get um you know follow through with legal action if, which we may very well do so the project was supposed to be completed after this amendment on december 15th and now it's december 19th and we don't have any problem. so we're going to probably end up calling our attorney and we'll have to start taking some action it shouldn't be hard he's got all the information he's got He's he's presented just about everything. It's just that we need the final report and something needs to be submitted to the division of control right. and go to the state for their approval potentially for the national park service. So it was the same consultant who did the update to our water availability historic district mm -hmm. and did an excellent job. So all right. So um the next project uh Tom had mentioned is a grant funded project. Um and this has to do with the bylaw rewrite. So uh, the planning commission is working on the unified development bylaw, the first phase, and we applied, as you may recall, for a bylaw modernization grant, a $25,000 grant request. Um, we have not received word yet. We should hear in January. So uh, hopefully in time to know what we're actually putting into the into the budget for sure, but uh, it does have a $2,500 cash local match, which you approved. So um, that's um, that project. And then uh, the special project reservoir is a pass through that we do each year with Friends of Waterbury Reservoir. This is the eighth year we've done it. So um, we've uh, applied for the funding and um, hopefully we'll, you know, we'll get a grant there. Then um, the trees, we don't uh, have anything yet. Um, so we end up applying for a grant. We would uh, approach you on that. If we end up um, applying for a grant last year, we had a $6,500 project. We have see pretty substantial amounts for trees. Don't you move them to the the public works budget? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's usually where we we have a placeholder here. Um, the um, Green Mountain Byway, uh, we contribute uh, $500 each year. That's with Doe uh, and Fort Worth County towns. That's an annual um, amount part of that project. Uh, if you have questions as I go through, I'll go through this pretty quickly because I know it's, it's late. So um, then we've got our legal service. Um, we have uh, one appeal now with um, Glenn Anderson's appeal of the three last subdivision across um, Sweet Road. So that's an ongoing um, legal. Uh, we're waiting on a decision on that. So we've had legal expenses there. We anticipate some continuing legal expense. And then uh, we also use the services of uh, Cisco Page and Fletcher for uh, more routine uh, planning assistance. And um, they they do an excellent job, and um, it's very helpful when you can get advice and help keep us out of appeals. To be honest with you, to make sure we're on solid ground. Um, the phone phone cost has gone up somewhat, um, so that is reflected there. Advertising we now advertise in the Times Argus with the uh, Waterbury Reader no longer in existence, so we're rebudgeting. That uh, two thousand dollar amount. Um, just so yeah. everyone knows, um, 
they do advertise in the electronic uh, well, we're not developed, but there are still laws on the books that require us to publish it. And that uh, is our only option. Regular one, you have publication of rights. That's correct. Yeah. So um, let's see, printing, that's primarily when we need to get things scanned and go on over and pack and send have large format print made for projects. Um, Office supplies, we buy a lot of paper still. We're still in a very paper oriented environment for better for the work. And uh, beautification. Uh, this uh, item is uh, reduced from what it once was because revitalizing Waterbury has taken over a lot of the beautification projects. And uh, that's, uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll probably talk about it a lot more, but I'll just give you a nutshell when we get to that uh, item. We need to meet with. Uh, Era. Uh training and tuition. This is for our conferences and workshops. Um, we go to manual free state conference we all um, back in October and uh in Maine. So it's be in New Hampshire next year. Uh mapping. So this line pays for services related to our parcel mapping and our online. Uh, mapping system that's on based on our website. So we split two different um, expenses. Um, one is for the update of our parcel map. It's done annually by a um, woman named Christine Chamberlain. So we split this with the assessor's office. Uh, so it's 1200 uh, goes out of our budget for um, game room services, and then there's an additional 1200 that goes to the company that maintains our online parcel mapping system. Uh, it's a great tool. We use it uh, virtually every day in the planning office. We um, teach members of the public, the real estate community, the development community, um, you know, attorneys, paralegals, it's a great tool. So we pay half of the PAI top, which is uh, 1200 out of this budget. And then there's an additional 400 uh, if we need uh, geographic information services with the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. And um, then they they provide 12 hours of free, if you will, it comes from our dues payment of our dues payment. That, uh, we have that additional 400 to help with services that they provide for uh, maps going to the bylaw update or uh, other projects. Then um, we're down to the dues for the Regional Planning Commission. That's uh, going to be the same as it was last year. It's on a per capita basis based on the 2020 census. That's unchanged. Uh, Central Mon Economic Development um, Corporation. Uh, Bill Kennedy says it's never changed since he started, mm -hmm. think, which is quite remarkable. But they provide the same services. So they find that a personal funding somewhere. They're free, free staff and uh, provide, I think, excellent services to the region. So uh, this news uh, from my community development association also includes. Uh, the staff dues for Vermont Planners Association and our New England chapter, uh, and also pays for um, membership in uh, the Association of Floodplain Managers. Uh, Neil's interested in uh, becoming a certified floodplain manager at some point, and that gives us access to the information. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, travel, just that mileage reimbursement. Uh, we do a lot less travel these days, so we do some. And, um, so we may need to get some funds in there. I think that um, was left out of the first draft, so we'll get some, uh, probably $500 back in there. Uh, see our computers are in good shape, so we're not looking for um, office equipment. Then on the uh, flip side, uh, the Conservation Commission, they may uh, work with Bill and Tom on some additional funding, but uh, that meeting hasn't occurred yet. So that $700 figure may may change a bit by the time this is finalized. 
Uh, revitalizing Waterbury, I won't go into a lot of detail. Um, there's uh, an amount in here that was uh, 17,000 um, that's continued. And then there's also additional amount that covers services for beautification of the downtown. They pay Mike Lociavo, the gardener that does the building here and the roundabout um, for hanging our flower baskets, for uh, hanging garlands, a number of other projects. It's taken the load off of volunteers. Uh, these projects have become very large. And um, so there's more money that goes into getting paid help just so volunteers don't get burned out. And they still support me. I should say we still I volunteer a lot of time on those projects as well. So um, I think that's pretty much the end of it. Um, probably the best thing to open up the questions. The justification gives more background on each of these items. I've pretty much given you the nutshell version. But, um, there are some grant projects that are at the end of the justification, a little more detail. Um, I know, Melissa, you, you were interested in a quick update on the parks study and master plan. Yeah, I just want to say what you said in your email really quickly. Yeah, to make sure yeah. so we had a meeting of our steering committee, and uh, that was last week. Uh, there were uh, concept plans that were presented. There was one concept for Hope Daisy Park that can be implemented in phases. Uh, there are actually four concepts for the area around the ice center. We're working on getting that narrowed down to yeah, uh, getting that narrowed down to um, probably two concepts, one keeping the entrance road where it is and one moving the entrance road to the north dead property along the railroad tracks where the utility poles are. So um, the goal here is to have the steering committee review some refined concepts in January, and then they'll make recommendations that will go to a, a public meeting that will have uh, you folks and the EFA commissioners um, involved with. It'll be in February, and um, we'll get some final input and then finalize the recommendations in the study in the master plan. So I think we're making good progress. Um, I think we've got consensus uh, around some items at any rate. And uh, you know we'll we'll obviously have options, especially relating to the ice center, but uh, hopefully have a, a plan that can be implemented in phases for, for both areas. Mm -hmm. So with Davy Park we've um, we're recommending adjustments to the disc golf course to respect more of the natural resources, the wetlands, the floodplain riparian area along Patrick Brook, and um, just try to really improve that, reestablish the nature trail, provide more ADA access to the shelter and to the playground, and uh, eventually to the ball fields. So I think there's a real effort to try to make that part more. Uh, Open and accessible, more respectful of the natural. So, is there specific feedback that you're looking for on the plans and that's now, um, or just opening? Yeah, the, the reason why uh, we gave some extra time because the concept plans uh, came from the consultant like a day before the meeting. So we really want to have an opportunity for uh, the select board, the e commissioners, the steering committee members, members of the public, provide comment. And um, and this is this is not the last uh, bite of the apple, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's just at this stage there's going to be another opportunity in January, and then there'll be a public, the public meeting in February. So it's really meant to be a progressive uh, process. But uh, I'm compiling the comments. That will come in by the end of the day Wednesday for those to the consultant and the steering committee, and then that can get incorporated into the uh, refinement. Um, the different questions from a different angle. Um, and I apologize, but I left page one of 47 on my desk. I, I believe. Uh, 
the planning income was, oh, here it is. Uh, we budgeted 22,000 this year, we've taken in 26,000 as of um, December 8th, and it might be another couple hundred dollars to come in. Do um, you remember when the last time planning fees were adjusted? It's been a while. It's been probably at least, um, wow, all that has been close to 10 years. It's been quite a long time. So the reason I ask yes. is, A, it's to just see how long the time it's been. And clearly, um, really since we hired Dina, but especially now with the deal, I think we kind of amped up our hours. We used to have a planning department that had a, a 20 hour planner, 25 hour planner. When Dina started, I think she was 30 hours. Yeah, the zoning administrator was. Now we, now we have two full time right. planning staff members. And I don't think that's going to change. Uh, once you retire, I think we're going to stay at that level. I think the, the workload is certainly there, set out, especially with the, you know, real wanting to uh, get up to speed on those work plans mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. So we might not be able to implement it for this budget year, but I think I would suggest that maybe Tom um, work with Steve and whomever to look at planning trees. Um, Going forward, and, you, know, you know, you could adopt them for July 1st or something else like that. But, um, you know, I, I think we're providing the public much more, and more of the planning budget is being covered by the tax pay as opposed to people who are submitting applications. So, this is what we Yeah, I think it's an excellent idea, Bill. And, uh, you know, and I can certainly work with you, Tom on a proposal and look, um, because our fees are quite reasonable. We have no impact fees, um, and not that we would recommend impact fees, but we can certainly look at some some reasonable increases to um, the zoning fees. Just uh, inflationary, you know, we look, sure. I mean, inflation was for the last three years been really low. So, yeah. you know, probably we haven't had that big a deal, but now we're then, but I think just that service level has amped up significantly in terms yeah, of the yes. hours that we should take that into consideration. And impact fees, I would, you really have to make sure on impact fees, if you're going to really follow the law, you know, you have to spend the impact fee money within a certain period of time. You have to identify the Project. And it has to be for something new that you wouldn't be otherwise. You're not really supposed to use impact fees just to, you know, uh, pay for things that you're already paying for. You know, the roundabout is a good example. We could have set money aside for that, but most of that was paid for by state and federal money. Same thing with, with Main Street. Uh, the roundabout was a new thing that could have qualified. Main Street would have been. So, in fact, these are a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, and the other thing I'll mention too, you mentioned the uh, whole blood play management program, and we're a member of the community rating system, and that requires maintenance, requires outreach. That's one of the reasons that the zoning administrator position went to a full time position now as the assistant planning and zoning administrator. Uh, with a much more of a floodplain management uh, component to it. So um, so I think there's additional services that uh, membership in the community rating system provides a 10% discount uh, to the uh, landowners who pay flood insurance. So um, that's uh, town-wide and uh, we move from a a level nine to a level eight, but it's the higher level um, when we did our five year uh, recertification in 2020. So that provides um, a benefit to people who play with flood insurance in areas like Grand Street and other uh, areas around town that are in the floodplain. That's awesome. Well, that's good. The only question I have is. 
just to make it a brief question and answer as well. With uh, with uh, one or two of the symptoms in pay rate or pay, pay scale, you have to just come on down. Why are healthcare costs down so much? So, so in pay rate. Yeah, Neil did fly. Um, so uh, Neil Neil's husband covers uh, there. He's a school teacher. Covers yeah. there. I bought it. Yeah. So, uh, and he's he's not planning on taking uh, his trip coming here. So that's that's the reason. But we would have to stay. Uh, you know, a new hire would like. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So just in that place. Yeah, no, that's the current situation. So, yeah, we're we hope that it was right. Any Sorry. other questions? Uh, just one question, uh, Steve. Are you anticipating any uh, new funding requests uh, based on the recommendations of these two studies? And will that be showing up elsewhere in the budget? Yeah. Um, not at this time. There is going to be some cost estimating that's to be done as part of the study. Uh, there are going to be all part cost estimates, things like um, potentially relocating the road to access. And, uh, yeah. So one of the things that I've mentioned to um, Tom is um, potentially that could be another funded project, uh, relocating the road. Uh, it's a it's a fairly large ticket item. The the estimates probably in the four hundred fifty thousand dollar range based on a think estimate from 2020 so it's not an inexpensive project but um you know i think with with park projects there are funding sources there's the BORAC program now and that might be a good uh source uh Danny, i know you're familiar with that program uh that may be a source where we can use the study as um basis for a, a you know Substantial requests and um, some of the private or nonprofit funding for, let's say, a uh, skate park or a soccer fields or some other uh, privately funded project could be potentially used for more for a project without um, a big ask for town funds. But there may very well be a, a town component. But there's nothing proposed in the budget at this time. We really need to get through the study, get consensus around. Um, what the community wants to see and then once we have a, a clear way forward we can look at we'll have some budget figures and, and we can look into that. so can you educate me on the timeline a bit i'm, I'm wondering if this sure. census will be achieved before this year's town meeting day oh well, yeah. Level, but i want to yeah the study uh the, the final recommendation the study will go to public meeting uh probably in february so yeah, the timing to do something that quickly is um, is not. I I don't I don't think it's the kind of project or projects that we want to run. We want to make sure we've got a solid uh, agreement about, especially in the flood board and the staff, and also from a broader public support side of things. Mike has a question also. <clears throat> Mike, when you're ready, we're ready for you. I'm, I'm unmuted. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, and, and maybe just, I think like you see like special projects, especially like we have the recreation study. Should that not maybe be kind of put into like a separate bucket? So it, you know, so the rest of the budget shows the cost of operating you know, the planning division. And that's almost like kind of a, you know, like a, it's not a capital expense, but it's, it's, it's a separate outside expense. I would like to hear uh, the two town managers and uh, Steve comment on that. Well, the, uh, that's really driven by the park study. I guess I think Mike, it does belong here only because within the confines of when department, you're routinely going to have special projects that are grant funded. And so if you have 
you just try to break out base operations, um, you can do that. But these sort of metro projects are really base operations to plan in a way. Um, and you know, in the end, I, you know, that second page, the, the impacts of property taxes, that's the number to look at in the bottom at the end. Right. So I, I would argue it's in the appropriate place. Yeah, I, I agree. I think for, I think for the purposes of planning, that's what we're doing right now. The park study is a plan. Once it's once the plan is finalized, Mike, and the uh, uh, there's uh, in an implementation budget bill, I believe the implementation budget will probably be in the in the recreation capital improvement budget. So for, for planning purposes, what we're paying the SEC group this year and and uh, to finish up next year, I think should be right where it is. And and but for implementation of the planning budget. Okay. Thank you uh, both. Thank you. Steve, Steve, do you do you agree? I assume you agree with both of them. No, I, I do, Mike. I think um, every year we've had uh, grant funded projects. We've been very successful getting grant funded projects for a host of different projects. So it does um, it makes the budget fluctuate some, and then we have a revenue side, which uh, you know we have to account for as well uh, for the grants that are coming in. But uh, I, I agree with Tom and Bill. I think, um, yeah, I think the planning side needs to be kept here so we can back it year to year. And um, same with, uh, well, the trees, we, we do put that into the highway department cemetery budget typically. So it's more of a placeholder here. That's true. And that's a good point. And what we're doing with it, what we have. When we did inventories and things like that, yeah. we paid that out of the planning because that was a pretty yeah, nice. more of a planning function. And then right. when we implemented planning. Thanks so much. I just, I just, you know, on behalf of, you know, like a layman looking at this, you know, we have like maybe these bumps and stuff like that, that kind of occur, but I agree with all of you. I think it probably <clears throat> here. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. Good. Yeah. The, the work plan went around too. So feel free to read through that. It, it gets into more of the detail and nitty gritty on uh, different projects. So just let me know if you have questions. We don't need to take a lot of time here to go through it. I don't think it's late. So, uh, but let me know if you have questions about that. Just shoot me an email or give me a call. One thing I just want to know so when the Parks Planning Special Committee finishes its work essentially, um, to some extent, the Recreation Board will take over some of the work as you approach town meeting day 2024. Uh, so I went to a rec meeting a couple weeks ago. Um, they mentioned they were authorized for 11 members, which I don't know what the bylaws or how it was created. Um, and I believe now they're at five. Mm -hmm. that, that, that strikes me as a very healthy number for a committee and, and a nice number to work with. But that strikes me as a committee that's going to be very impactful over the next year. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you might want to get under radar and just consider the members of that committee. Not more than additional. Yeah. So. Good idea. Great. Thank you. Steve. Okay. Very welcome. And just very quickly, um, before we leave budget stuff, uh, I'm not prepared to ask anything else. I did a real quick, quick dive today to look at where we stand on the free operating fund. I think we will end up with positive fund balances in all, all three of the funds. Um, Tom and I talked about the $95,000 in the from ARPA and the highway fund. And um, we both really believe that that $95,000 should show as revenue moving from the ARPA fund into the highway fund. A, it was budgeted that way. B, if you didn't have it right now, there's still, there's gonna be some changes to the actual of the budgets really right through the end of January because we're gonna get 
power bills, and fuel bills, and salt bills, and things like that that we're not going to pay until 2023 that will be posted back. But even today, with the numbers that I projected, um, we would have a slight deficit, about a half a uh, about a fifty thousand dollar deficit in the highway fund if we didn't the uh, ARPA money, uh, maybe forty thousand. If we move it, we have about a fifty thousand uh, dollar surplus. But the other thing that moving it does is it moves it into the general fund and. Uh, you know, if you remember back, I think it was probably March or April, the board made a motion that it was wanted to use uh, ARPA funds uh, to replace lost revenue. And that was something that makes it really easy to uh, track and account for the, for the spending. And we thought we had $695,000 of it into the general fund this year, but the flood kind of foiled out. Um, we did give fifty thousand dollars to CD Fiber, so there'll be ninety-five plus fifty, so there'll be one hundred and forty-five thousand of the money that will be moved into the general fund for this year. But because we want to show it as a general fund revenue, it makes sense because we budgeted that ninety-five last year to move it. Something I talked about. Six hundred thousand. No, uh, if I didn't take it, uh, Tom's feeling is that well, um, if I didn't take it since it was budgeted for a specific thing, let's just leave it. But I think probably what we're going to end up recommending is to be more time with me. But I think we'll probably try to move as much of the ARPA money into the. Uh, Revenue, general fund revenues in 2023 to just get it all in the general fund. And then you can appropriate it appropriate from fund balance. You'll have a, a, a high fund balance. You'll be able to do everything that you were planning to do, but getting it moved over there will be, uh, will be who things for the town and the town will be able to report to the treasury department what, uh, what you're going to use it for. So, Anyway, um, the general fund right now, um, I left the first page out. Uh, you know, we've still got some going from taxes or taxes that haven't come in yet, but um, I'm projecting a pretty lengthy fund balance in the, in the uh, general fund um, that will be helpful when it comes to uh, taxation, I think fifty thousand dollar fund balance in the highway, and about a ten or eleven thousand dollar fund balance in the library. So I think we had a good budget year. Uh, it has some over expenditures. We're going to this at your next meeting, whether it's me or Tom, but we'll try to have uh, as final numbers as we can uh, at your first meeting in January with the understanding that there's going to be some money that comes in after that that have to be posted, but uh, we'll have a really good handle on things at, at the next meeting for you. But right now, things look good in terms of where 2022 is ending. All that translates into uh, 2023. Yes. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. And on the topic of ARPA funds, um, I've uh, shared some emails with Down Street and Nicole Anderson. Um, they have a request for ARPA funds. And so I told her I'd pencil her in for the January 16th meeting. Um, and my advice to her was in essence to create like a grant application, give us your sources and uses for the project, and let us know what, what's different. If you receive ARPA funds or don't receive ARPA funds, does the design change, does the timeline change, elaborate on some of those issues? Um, so she'll be before you in about a month. Are we meeting the 16th or are we shifting the Tuesday? I was going to ask. Because Janet can go and get us a Um. So the third was the Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the regular yeah, we well. talked about it. So right now, I'm not okay today is not a. Holiday for us. We typically 
I I at least I heard it the same way you did. I thought I was about to get a day off. But <laughs> I think um if everyone is okay. Mike, would you be able to do Tuesday, January 17th instead of Monday the 16th? You're there, Chris, I'm here, just, just looking for my unmute button. I I could go anyway. I'm available, you know, with the Martin Luther King Day, you know, whether we want to move it because it's a holiday. I know it's not, you know, a town holiday, but we could move it to Tuesday. I could go either either direction. Right, so you're available Tuesday. Um, yep. Chris, would you be? Yeah, okay. Um, well, then let's, um, if Tom, if that's okay with you, let's move it and then um, see if that works for me as well. Okay. And then uh, there's been some references about us needing to meet uh, additional uh, official meetings because of budget season. Yes. Do we, do we plan those now? Or yeah, now? It's every week. yeah, it's every week. Yeah, it's every week. Yeah, every week. It's every week. So, so we're, if you're lucky, you won't have to be the 31st, whatever the last, yeah, okay. the last, the first Monday of the month, but Tuesday the 3rd, mm. Monday the following mm. Monday. This room is rented that day. Oh. What? This room is rented on the 17th. Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, till 5.30. This meeting starts at 7. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, we're good. I'm sorry. I feel like I've been here since 4. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we do. As well as we do. Commission to uh, warrant the turn over those four properties to the town. Uh, the Eastwood Commission to approve the transfer of the Rusty Park and Park. The um, 10, 8, uh, yeah, 4, 6, and Park Street, which is the Elm Street parking lot. And then uh, the middle. Um, at the welcome sign near the roundabout. Um, Skip had some questions about the deed and the, the references back and back to the uh, for the ice center site. They did not approve that one. So I've got the three that I just mentioned to you now. Our staff recommends that we accept these properties. Um, and if you accept them, then 
script will be able to sign the deeds and we'll get them recorded. Um, I definitely heard from Daisy today that if the state has resolved the other one, so at your next meeting, hopefully, well, nothing is executed. I'm going to go keep up this to transfer that for part of the skips. Uh, now that the history didn't play giant keep up, <laughs> what was it the deed? But he's, he's reconciled with the attorney. But we thought it not really appropriate for this board to approve it when he but owns it and they haven't approved it yet. But of the three that they did approve, yeah. the only that the vote will be yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, we can accept the proposal to transfer the property to the property. Yeah, motion and second, any further discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed? I did not get a verbal from Mike, so let's mark him as the same because I think technology. Let's go. Mike? Yeah, let's <laughs> call it. Yeah. That's okay. We have not on the motion passes. Hmm. All right. Lastly, lastly, that's bringing more to inspire contract. Uh, I think we're good. Really, yeah. Yeah. You had a you have a memo and a contract and everything. Yeah, I think we did. Yeah. So, I did. Just to note, I voted in favor of my. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So you have um, at the draft, uh, not the draft contract, but you have last year's contract is going to be the reference uh, for Moortown. Um, and I, uh, sorry for Dr. Barry, which is the larger one. Um, and then give me the budget estimate. And I've uh, been in contact with Dr. Barry. So um, I think we'll have a final contract before you, similar to last year, um, sometime towards the end of January. We need the final uh, equalization numbers, and that's it. Proposal? No, no More equalization is. numbers. Um, More town is a, it's a very simple to cover route to and maybe love each other. It's been twenty five hundred dollars uh, in two thousand ten, uh, and I went to the board town select board at the end of the fifth meeting. That's why we're here to begin with the meeting, mm -hmm. and uh, they were agreeable to have it go up to thirty two sixty five uh, for uh, what we covered. Uh, if you put the land show in Lovers Lane, it would go up to fifty seven hundred. And it would be that whatever those prices for two years, 23 and 24, and then beginning with 25, it would be justified. Some of these, uh, you know, it's just a little carrot for them. So if you give them two years at the same price and then say, you know, they're, they're not going to argue with it. And it's, it's better to get it. And in the past, we've offered a contract with Dexbury at this meeting. And we told them if if the numbers work out, it's to your favor. We'll 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 lower it. If the numbers work out, it should be a little higher. But we're missing the equalization, so we're not quite pretty straight. Well, so we don't have to wait until the final contract. Um, fantastic. Okay. Well, then let's uh, have a motion to adjourn. Alex? And second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Aye.